Okay, let's go ahead and get rolling here. As with any event put on in our tribal communities and by our tribal nations, we always start out with a blessing and an honor song. And so I'd first like to call up the Squaxin drummer and he's gonna provide us with our first honor song. Up next, we have our Nez Perce drum group, War Whistle. They're gonna be providing us with a flag and an honor song.
and drum and war whistle. You may be seated. 
Next, I would like to bring forward and introduce our witnesses for the Salmon and Orca Summit. I'd first like to ask Kean Singer Green to come forward. Next, I'd like to ask Sylvia Miller. And last, I'd like to ask Justin Hayes to come forward. Our witnesses will take note of the events that occur here today and tomorrow, and they will be seated and provide testimony at the end. I first just wanna say good morning. My name is Kaylani Scott. I'm the communications manager for the Nez Perce tribe. It's such a joy to see everybody here. I think for a lot of us, this is our first kind of social outing and coming together. Um, and it, it feels so strange at times, but it feels so good to see people's faces in person, actually see smiles. So I thank you all for making the trek. I know there was a short turnaround um, to being here, but we know that this is important and critical, and that's why you are all here. So thank you. I also just want to take a moment to thank the Squaxin Island Nation for hosting us and being so gracious and welcoming our people and our different nations coming to this area um, and also the staff. They've done an excellent job in working with us, pulling this together and making it happen. So thank you. Up next, I would like to ask Chairman Chris Peters from Squaxin Island Tribe to come forward and provide us with a welcome. He's quote, Twal Gualapu, Gualapu, TD said, Siaya, Klabish, Titsta, Klabish, Titsta, Klabish, Titsta, Squawk Sadub's Chad. To all of you, my friends, family, relations, welcome. My indigenous name is Klabish. It was named after my great great grandfather, and it's something I carry with me. It's honorable. I carry with me every day. And I am Squaxin. My Anglo American name is Chris Peters. And I have the honor of serving my people as their tribal chair. We welcome you to our traditional lands. We call ourselves the people of the water. Our traditional lands, before being placed on an island for a short time, spread across multiple inlets of the South Salish Sea including where you're currently sitting here today. As you're driving in, maybe from the Olympia, Seattle area, the last inlet you passed there was, is what we call Totten Inlet. And along the shores of Totten Inlet and in this valley here uh, that we call Camilchi Valley lived a people. And those people were known as the Topeakson Band of People. 
And the Topeaks were one of seven bands that now make up the Squawks and Island Tribe. The Topeaks and people, we honor those individuals that lived here and all the Squawksons who stewarded these lands since time immemorial. And today we as Squawks honor our ancestors by living within the seven generations mindset. We still take pride in being stewards of the environment, the air, the waterways. We respect and honor our animal friends and we sustain a, a way of life for future generations and our children. And we are gracious and we walk with gratitude in everything we do. That's how we honor our ancestors and our future generations and living in that seven generations mindset. Over the last 150 to 200 plus years, there's been a societal systematic degradation of our environment. I don't think I need to tell you guys that, it's obvious. And the way we're headed, this is leading to the eventual extinction of our salmon, our sacred salmon. And a holistic approach must be taken to turn that tide. And we can't wait any longer. We have to take action now. We have to keep this fight against climate change. We have to control emissions and pollution. We have to protect our waterways, our rivers, our stream, and our precious riparian zones. We have to protect our estuaries, including restoring many of our estuaries back to their natural habitat. And of course, the dams. One of the single most destructive things society has done to destroy our natural habitat and kill our salmon. And for what? human gain, capitalist growth, human creature comfort, selfishness. We as indigenous people have lived as a collective with our environment for thousands of years, and now society has been destroying it. And it's time to take action and make change. And the time is now. We as indigenous brothers and sisters have the voice and the power as a collective to bring this change forward and see it through. My hands go up to every single one of you for being here today, holding this summit. And as I said before, we, the people of the water, are honored that you're all here and for such an important noble event. Have a great summit and welcome to Squawkson. My hands go up to every single one of you. Thank you. Hey, Shabbat. Thank you. We now like to provide an opportunity for Vice Chairman Shannon Wheeler from this Purse Tribe to come forward and give you some welcoming comments. Hatsme we oikolo him yuma inam waswanik ti toka tim to we oak to boo. My name is Shannon Wheeler. I, I have the privilege to serve as the vice chairman uh, for the Nespers tribe. And this is a great opportunity for us uh, to uh, come before you today uh, to speak the truth. And it's what uh, the proposal that Congressman Simpson has brought forward has been is addressing the truths to the to the to the problems that we all face, and that has been a, a bold, brave move by Congressman Simpson to uh, come forward the way that he did in a comprehensive uh, fashion to address a lot of issues that uh, are tied to the water, that are tied to the salmon. And one thing that we have found out through that, uh, through this process is that not only uh, the Snake River and the Columbia Basin tribes are facing this issue, but the Salish Sea tribes as well are facing the same similar issues here uh, in, this, in this part of the country in the Pacific Northwest. And that's why the uh, Salmon Orca Summit uh, has been uh, brought to Squaxin Island. And we thank Chairman Peters and the Squaxin Island tribe for, for hosting us here uh, on, on their 
uh, Pikawatis boom, your, your Kiatawatis uh, squawks in the sacred land of the Squaxin people. Uh, it's just a great opportunity for us to share our stories with one another. As we, as we do continue to share our stories with one another that we see the common thread uh, between each of our tribes that we all face, you know, I mean, we can go back uh, many years, uh, you know, uh, pre-1855 when a lot of us signed our treaties. I know Medicine Creek Treaty was signed then and many other treaties over here as well as the, the treaties in the Columbia Basin uh, were signed. There's also, you know, the the obligation that uh, Congressman Simpson knows that he, uh, that the United States government has uh, to the tribes. But if you look at uh, anything pre-1855, you know, the wealth of the Pacific Northwest uh, was recognized by Lewis and Clark when they first came out and uh, 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 the Corps of Discovery uh, uh, expedition. And what they found was a, a great wealth, a great wealth of timber, a great wealth of, of uh roots and berries and and a lot of indigenous people out here that were uh doing very well and and there was a great wealth of salmon uh and that's really you know in our creation story the salmon gave himself to us in the beginning uh because he knew that we would be uh we would need that help and in a pragmatic point of view for, for today why we look at that we can we can say that salmon was already given himself to the Pacific Northwest because of all the nutrients that were delivered by the salmon from the ocean to the mountaintops. And that's what Lewis and Clark seen. And so many times the tribes had have, have bargained for a way of life and had had given up much land for for the westward movement and and the the strength and uh, it, economics of, of this country today was built on uh, the Pacific Northwest. But at the same time in that growth, something happened and a decimation of salmon happened. And so, you know, as we, as we feel the first effects of, of not a lot of salmon being in our, in our diets, in our, in our waters, there's also the effect that it's having on the landscape, the long-term effects. So as, as we continue to fight uh, for what we bargained for, or if you're an executive order tribe, what the trust responsibilities that the uh, federal government has to us, Congressman Simpson has brought that forward from a, from a perspective of of a congressional action that that for dam breaching it takes a congressional action for appropriations it takes a congressional action for a, tr a treaty with the with the tribes that trust responsibility that's a united states uh issue that congress and the administration need to have that action, have that relationship with sovereign governments. And that's what that's what the proposal brings forward. And as we look, uh, we'd just like to, as I, as I say that, I'd like to thank uh, Mitch Silvers on the left over there, that's Senator Crapo's uh, uh, staff and Sean Bills is uh, Senator Cantwell uh, staff, uh, or Senator Murray, sorry, uh, excuse me, Sean. But, but, that is, uh, you know, who needs to take action. And, and I know, you know, that we've heard uh, many times of the four state process, uh, the four governors of, of uh, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and Montana uh, to look at this issue. Uh, but for us at, at Nest First, that we, we understand that that's really a step backwards for us. That may be a tool in a full proposal for con uh, in Congressman Simpson's proposal to be able to use that as a tool, but uh, the trust responsibility doesn't fall within the governors. It falls within the congressional leaders like Congressman Simpson and the administration. 
So that's what we're thankful for that Congressman Simpson and the bold and, and uh, bravery that he has come forward to solve a problem and not only solve a problem for salmon, but solve the problems for, for agriculture, for energy, for uh, uh, recreation, for tourism, for all these other uh, uh, areas of concern that are out there and to really build a stronger, better Pacific Northwest that uh, puts us in the, in the lead in the world. And, you know, if we don't take those steps and those now, uh, we're, we're already falling behind. I mean, you look at other nations that are, that are out there in energy, in renewable energies, we're falling behind them. We're, you know, there's just, you know, in, in agriculture practices and uh, we're just, we're continuing to, to fall behind. And, and this proposal solves a problem with salmon, but it also moves the, the uh, United States ahead in, in those areas and moving us into the future. So I'd just like to, at this time, applaud Congressman Simpson for his bravery and uh, for such a comprehensive uh, proposal to bring forward. So if we get a round of applause for Congressman Simpson. So we'd also like to thank the tribal leaders that are here uh, and also on Zoom, uh, I don't know exactly, I know we have uh, quite a large number of uh, people that are on virtual right now, but it is, uh, as uh, uh, Kehlani Scott had mentioned, that is good to see your faces, smiling faces, and uh, uh, be here in person. Uh, I know we've all been uh, hoping and waiting for this day so we could uh, get back into these meetings. A lot of times things don't happen the way they do uh, in uh, on vir in virtual meetings as they do in person where you can get a lot of those creative juices actually working and, and those expressions to one another uh, at that personal level. So we'd just like to uh, uh, thank everybody for being here and hope that we have a very productive uh, two days here at the Salmon Orcas Summit. And with that, I will uh, turn it over uh, to Kehlani Scott. Thank you. Thank you. So just to give you a little rundown of how today's gonna work. Today is the opportunity for our tribal leaders to provide their testimony as to why the salmon and orca are so critical and important to them and their culture. This is a historic moment as we've had several tribal nations gather together here. It doesn't happen often and it is challenging to coordinate when I first learned about uh, Simpson's proposal, I was told something big's coming, just wait. And so that's what I did. Um, and then when it did come out, we just hit the ground running. Uh, so trying to coordinate and pull everybody in has definitely been a challenge, but I'm so grateful that we're here today and get to share in this moment together. So we will have representatives uh, from each tribe here today coming forward to provide their testimony. And I just want you to keep in mind as these individuals come forward, it's not one voice that they're speaking for, but thousands. Not only are they representing themselves, but their tribal nations and those that cannot speak, which is why we're here. The salmon and the orca, though they cannot be here, we're speaking for them because we do hear them and we're hoping everybody else can hear them too. So with that, I'd first like to welcome up uh, the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Reservation, Vice Chairman Jeremy Wolf, to kick off our tribal leader testimonies. Nobody told me I was first. It's fine. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Wolf. My Indian name is Hatsil Iltop. I uh, appreciate all, the, all of you guys to, uh, being here today on this important day. Um, as it's been said before, um, every day is an important day for us. Um, we look forward to carrying on the things that our ancestors have provided for us, and so we can do the same for those who come after us. 
Uh, with this, uh, we have a, a statement that uh, we've worked on uh, with our staff, um, our, our leadership, and, uh, and our committees and commissions um, that are appropriate to, to, to address the situation. And, and I think that's a big part of what we're trying to accomplish here as well, is making sure that we're all involved internally um, as well as externally, working with uh, other tribes, working with uh, um, other NGOs, working with uh, leadership uh, in DC um, and within the states as well. So uh, appreciate that. And with that, I'll read our statement. <clears throat> For thousands of years, salmon thrived in the Columbia Basin. We had plenty of salmon to sustain us and plenty more to trade in others with others from far away. Salmon have been a source of sustenance, a gift, religion, and a foundation of culture for our people since time immemorial. Their existence is vital and linked to ours. We can save salmon and make the economy of the Pacific Northwest even stronger at the same time. such as the lower four Snake River dams, consist <clears throat> coincident with development of a new energy plan for the region and implementation of aggressive energy conservation programs, end quote. That policy is still vital today. Last year, the Board of Trustees reaffirmed its commitment to study the best path forward for dam breaching, both by motion in March and again by resolution in October. That October 2020 resolution, number 20-096, directed the C2IR to develop tools that will help inform policy decisions on salmon going into the future, including, quote, a regional energy plan to provide solutions that include Snake River Dam breaching and or alterations co coincident with the development of other energy and transportation sources, end quote. On April 14th and 15th of this year, a majority of the Columbia Basin tribes met in Mission, Oregon to discuss salmon, sturgeon, lamprey, and other aquatic resources of our basin and what was needed to recover and sustain these critical first foods. We also discussed what was needed to sustain the other sectors that depend on the Columbia River, the agriculture, transportation, energy, recreation, and commerce interests. The majority of these tribes agreed on six principles going forward. These principles were included in the ATI resolution 2021 23. We stand behind these principles. We will read them here as the C2R believes they provide the best path forward for collaborative collaboration to restore and sustain our Columbia River salmon and their ecosystem and ensure all sectors that depend on the Nchiwana not only survive, but also and thrive for future generations. The six principles are one, the true wealth of our region begins with the health of our rivers, fish and ecosystem they support, which is our culture, history and future. Two, agriculture is an important part of our region's economy. Three, Affordable and reliable power is important to regional families and business, tribal and non-tribal. Four, providing legal certainty for the vast majority of federal dams in the Columbia Snake River basins is a necessary element of lasting solution. Five, a significant federal infrastructure investment in alternative energy and transportation provides a unique opportunity to restore salmon while keeping power affordable and maintaining agricultural commerce, agricultural commerce. Six, a comprehensive legislate, legislative solution is preferable to all other avenues and is urgently needed. We as Indian people cannot succeed alone. Here we accomplish these goals <clears throat> is a function of our understanding and addressing the needs of all people in the basin 
Indian and non-Indian alike. Once again, I appreciate your time. Thank you. I'd next like to ask Devin Boyer, chairman for the Shoshone Bannock tribe to come forward and provide his testimony. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the tribes for allowing us to be here today. My name is Devin Boyer. <clears throat> I'm the chairman of the Shoshone Bannock tribes. We're here today to look at opportunities and abilities. In the end, it creates unity. We're also here today to express ourselves and how important our finned ones are to us. The orca, the salmon, and all fish. Everything that lives in all waters. Those are the veins of our mother earth below us. We're all connected in the universe above us. All our directions, all the things that we need to keep pure, all the things that we need to keep plentiful. That consists of a lot of things in this world that we currently live in. I'm gonna go back a little bit. My uh, grandfather before me, tribal leader, Shoshone Bannock tribes, his daughter, my mother before me, one of the council members of the tribe, and also my uncle, also one of the council members of the tribe. So I'm third generation tribal leader and on my birth certificate, it says Devon Owl Boyer. In our language, that's Munovich. It means messenger of death. I asked my grandfather why that was put on my birth certificate. He said, because that's what you are. Your time will come in your time. You'll need to know this message. We're at that time now. The message is, is without our offend ones, we're looking at death. So we have to take care of things. We have to start over. We have to be resilient. We have to recover. We have to move forward. Every decision made is for our future. So having that said, that's why we're here today amongst all these tribal leaders to support Mr. Simpson's initiative to combine all the things that he has to say and others have to say to unite for the future. It's imperative because we're all connected regardless of what color we are in this world, we have to unite or we look at death. That is not a future we need to look at. We need to look at being positive, we need to look at moving forward, reconstructing and changing the way that we currently live in order to survive. That's what's imperative. That's the message for today. Having that said, part of the testimony is our people were named after the salmon. That's where we're from. That uh, blood vein, the waters of our earth, carries those finned ones. In the beginning, in one, just one of our creation stories, the salmon were numerous. And each stream and each river, you could see their backs. You could cross on top of them to get to the other side. They used to bump into each other and bump off the sides of all the rivers and creeks. And because they were doing that, one of our majestic animals, the elk, was watching them one day. 
and seeing how they were being damaged and hurt because they're bumping off the sides of rocks and the sides of the banks. So the elk asked them for an exchange because the salmon had ivory teeth in the beginning, the two teeth that the elk currently have. So they asked for that change, that exchange for their muscle from the elk, their strength, so that they wouldn't get damaged. And so they changed. They gave the elk the teeth and they gave the salmon the muscle. That's just one of our creation stories. There's many more. But having that said, they, the other one of the other creation stories is we have to speak for our finned ones, our four-legged, our winged ones, the ones that crawl, the ones we can't see are protectors. In order for human beings to exist as tribal people at that time, we, we had to exchange. So those, those animals gave us that speech so that we could speak for them today. They also knew that this time would come. So in order to be that, in order to be the protectors of all of these living things in the veins of our earth, we're all gathered here today. Now, because of the extinction levels of our finned ones, we, we need to meet with leadership such as Mr. Simpson in our new administration in order to change, in order to look at what's available as far as energy so that we can get away from the dams. Now there's numerous videos out there, different tribes, different peoples across this world where they've already done that because they knew that extinction level was coming and they're succeeding. We have to change in order to do that same success. Now, what that means is we're speaking for the future. All of our grandchildren and all of those generations that are yet to come. We have to speak for them, make decisions now in order for that survival to be met. Every renewable energy that currently exists and is changing for something better is where we need to be in order to take care of the climate change that we're facing now in this world. So it's imperative that we unite. It's imperative that we move forward. And that means change. Now change is always hard and always tough, but we're talking about survival. So we must. So in order to reorganize, in order for our rivers and our waters and our oceans to exist clean and plentiful means we have to change. We're ready to do that today at Shoshone Bannock Tribes. And we're hoping that the message is sent to everyone, not just tribal leaders or other tribes, but the entire world. We must change. We can do it. We've seen it in the past if we learn from our history. We all can survive, but we have to go through that change in order to do that. As the Shoshone-Bannock tribes, we're gonna ask uh, Mr. Simpson, Congress and others in leadership and administration, we're close to a billion dollars in order to do that because the funds have to be made available in order to change. Now that consists of a lot of things, technologies in solar, technologies in wind, technologies and other things to create energy, to replace that energy that we're currently using as far as dams, hydro power is consists of. So we have to do these kind of things, but that means we need more than just a voice. That means we need the vote. We need that power to express ourselves and to carry on for this world. We all know it as tribal people. The rest of the world needs to know it as well. So that's why we're here today, to, to give you that message, to give you that knowledge and to where we need to be in order to survive in this world. So we truly thank Mr. Simpson and all the things that he's done. 
He's born and raised in the Blackfoot area, which is uh, our homeland as well. So he knows where we're coming from, but the rest of the world needs to know it as well. So I thank each and all of you for being here today. I thank each and all of you for expressing yourselves and your testimony. I'd like to thank all the drummers and the singers this morning for bringing in the heartbeat. That's imperative for everything that we do in the future. Thank you again. Next, I would like to ask Leonard Forsman, chairman of the Suquamish tribe to come forward and provide his testimony. Oh, well, uh, actually, Hill uh, was uh, looked on the agenda and I was on for tomorrow, so I was uh, unprepared, but you gotta be ready anytime, right, Congressman? You never know when you're gonna get called on. And uh, I'd like to thank all the previous speakers for um, their good words and um, on all the people that came, people virtually that are attending as well. I'm Leonard Forrestman, my ancestral name is Gui, and I'm chairman of Squamish Tribe and also president of affiliated tribes in Northwest Indians. And uh, Terry Parr is here as well, our executive director, <clears throat> and uh, Joel Moffat, um, our natural resources uh, lead. Um, appreciate the work he's done with Shannon and the rest to uh, put this summit together. And um, Salmon is, of course, the one unifying, well, one of many, but one of the major, the, the major unifying factor between the tribes of the Pacific Northwest. Um, the salmon are very hardy and um, strong species um, and uh, has sustained our people um, for thousands of years. And um, their hardiness, of course, brings them way up into the inside of the um, uh, Pacific Northwest. So not only out on the coast, but in the Salish Sea and on the rivers of the Sound, um, and also um, on the, the Columbia River uh, system as well. And uh, we're a uh, permanent and sustainable and uh, dependable source of food uh, for our people. And not only that, a um, important part of our way of life and uh, supporting our ceremonies. And many of us in this room were, were raised on salmon, um, both for food and also for um, trade. And, um, you know, also a lot of politics around salmon um, that brought us together to allow us to uh, not only fight for an opportunity to harvest, but also to manage. And um, the Bolt decision um, in 1974, affirmed in, by the Supreme Court in 79, um, really acknowledged uh, the tribes as, as uh, sovereign governments in, you know, in an appropriate way. So not only were we fighting for uh, the salmon and the habitat, um, we we're also fighting for our right to govern um, our way of life and to, um, you know, have meetings like this where um, the United States Congress and uh, the states and local governments are all engaged with us in trying to um, um, reach these uh, common, I sometimes common goals. Um, I think that pathways to reaching the goals that we have are restoring salmon are diverse. Um, but um, I think that what we're hearing is not working. So uh, we need to get uh, together and make uh, some bold, um, bold actions. Um, I, uh, I've been uh, chairman since 2005 and um, as Suquamish, I was on council for um, 15 years prior to that. So I've been at this for a while. And then in 2017, I had the honor of becoming the president of Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians. And um, we've been working really hard on a lot of natural resource issues. And uh, that takes up a lot of my time. I know it takes up a lot of your time because that's where the heart of our uh, culture and our, our identity is. Um, so I've taken on a lot of those uh, um, activities um, in support of uh, um, preserving our habitat. And that's 
starts at the local level, as many of you are engaged in the local level with your counties and your cities and, and with your own people and uh, trying to understand the importance of having a sustainable way of life that uh, not only supports us, but also balances our need to preserve uh, habitat for our, uh, our uh, natural resources that are, you know, our brothers and sisters. Um, whether it be deer and elk, salmon, clams, crab, eels, all those different things that the creator put on this earth. And we all have our, our oral history that tells about how those things were created. And um, all of these stories are somewhat common in the fact that most everything, like uh, previous leaders said, you know, has a human um, aspect to it. So we aren't any different. And uh, we need to uh, remember that as we move forward that uh, our, um, I like it's Billy Frank, who was uh, very often in this room, and uh, we honored his life in this room, uh, said that, you know, if the salmon go, we, we're not too far behind. So I think that we're all united in that. It's just finding a way that uh, um, we can all unite behind. Um, one of the things I did a couple of years ago was I was on the um, uh, Orca uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale uh, Task Force. I was appointed by the governor. I was one of many people appointed by the governor to be on that task force. And it brought a diverse group of people, not only from government, but also from uh, nonprofits and local businesses and uh, ports and a lot of uh, different interests across the um, uh, political landscape of the Northwest and uh, uh, primarily Washington, of course. So we had whale watchers and whale um, um, researchers and we had some tribal leaders. We had a lot of all the state and federal agencies you could think of. Um, we had commercial, non-Indian commercial fishermen. Um, we had the Association of Washington Business. We had a lot of people there. And the, so the, the theme became that we had three primary things that, that science told us was to need the, the orcas need. First, they need food. Um, so they can't survive without food first, because the reason the toxics are impacting their childbirth and their overall health is because they get thin. And as they get thin, the toxics that they retain in their fat are more um, um, deliverable or transferable to their organs and makes them sick. And then that also leads to uh, losing their young. So, um, and then the third thing, so the first thing was food, Second thing was toxics. And the third thing was uh, uh, vessel traffic. So those are the three things we focused on and how do we address all those things? So, um, you know, I think that um, when the, the, they, we studied the, um, the, the, the um, alternatives, different alternatives and, and different pathways in the Snake River Dam removal was one of those um, alternatives. It was, pretty controversial um, to be included on the agenda. Um, and we had a lot of discussions about that. And uh, there was definitely lines drawn, a lot of testimony um, about that that we heard, both for saving um, the, uh, the dams and what they do provide, and a lot of um, alternative um, uh, perspectives on why they could be removed without a whole lot of impact on the economies affected. So I learned a whole lot about the issue then. And um, since then, we've had a great unification of the tribal leaders in this room and around the Northwest and on the Columbia River um, about, the, um, about the, um, the challenge ahead. And it's, it's very, very uh, time sensitive because of the extinction issue, which we're gonna hear about more later. Um, but unfortunately, Congress isn't always super time sensitive. No offense, Congressman. <laughs> but we appreciate your, your bold, uh, boldness to take your uh, plan forward. But um, so that's one of the big challenges we have. And I know that we're here to 
kind of unite around salmon as, as affiliated tribes, Northwest Indians, we want to unite around salmon and, um, and kind of create a whole ecosystem that includes the Columbia, the coast and uh, the Salish Sea. And so, um, as you know, that can be a challenge somewhat politically because there's different solutions in different places, but we all are united by the fact that we're not fishing any, or we're barely fishing anymore, if at all. And so um, if we can work together, and I've talked to Shannon a lot about this and, um, you know, um, he's been great. He's just been um, just very determined. I don't know if anybody noticed that about Shannon, but he's very determined. And I've told him every reason why um, I'm not, well, I just told him every obstacle that we're up against. He says, oh, well, we can deal with that. We can deal with that. So they're still there. Um, it's a challenge politically. Um, and um, we, we, we got to keep pushing this though. And uh, because um, uh, the, the, we don't have any time, to, we have very little time here. And uh, we do have the issue of this being, uh, these dams being in Washington. So we need the Washington delegation to get in, engaged and uh, they're here to listen. Um, and then we got to make sure that, um, you know, we keep salmon recovery in all, and, and Shannon has said this, he says, we wanna bring everybody in. We, wanna, we want more funding for everybody um, as we move forward. So that's a challenge, but we want, I don't think we should be divided by that. Um, it takes a little time for us because we both have our different um, political um, relationships and we need to educate our uh, congressional delegations about how the, this is important to, to all the Pacific Northwest tribes, just like we have challenges here in the Salish Sea. Um, with culverts, with um, um, loss of um, uh, habitat, um, the riparian buffers that need to be preserved. Um, and also uh, we have issues with uh, marine mammals, um, uh, also being predators. Uh, we, so there's all these different um, obstacles there. So, uh, you know, we, we have to remember how important that uh, this is to the entire ecosystem and including the uh, Southern Rose and Keller whales who feed on these king salmon. They love king salmon and can't blame them for loving king salmon. Uh, we wish they sometimes would eat some of the sea mammals like their, their, their cousins to the north do, uh, but they don't really have a really strong desire to eat seals. So um, uh, that's, that's something we might have to train them to do, just kidding. Um, but anyway, um, the, they do love Chinook salmon, so they look for them and they go to the mouth of the river, Columbia River, as I understand, every year to look for them. So um, if we can bring more fish into the system by creating better habitat, we may have to in short term investment hatcheries um, until we get the wild runs uh, re, uh, restored. Um, we're gonna have to do a little of both and I think they can coexist. Another obstacle that we face. So. Um, you know, we um, uh, at Suquamish um, were um, primarily a lot of small streams that we try to maintain. We do have one wild run of chum salmon left that we're trying to restore. Um, there's th there were three big culverts on that stream. Um, the first one um, was the Kitty Hawk culvert at the mouth, and it just served about 10 houses on the other side of the creek. We we're able just to remove that culvert. We didn't have to replace it um, with the bridge or anything. And then uh, above Highway 3, uh, the big highway between Paul's Bow and Silverdale, um, there's a... Um, um, big culvert there, really, really long culvert, uh, blocking culvert there. And then above that, there's what they call Golf Club Hill uh, Road. And that one's, that one's out and there's a new bridge there, um, almost done, that one's almost done. And then now the state is going to put a bridge for SR3 is. So that's gonna be a big project as well. So we're hoping that we can keep that wild uh, chum salmon runs, um, um, irrelevant, but we haven't fished on that for years. Um, one year, the orcas came into the um, dyson that you may remember, and uh, they feasted on those uh, chum salmon for 
about a month. So they were all over in the Bay there. They haven't been back since. So the numbers have been And then the, the skipper on the ferry got on the, on, the, uh, on the public address system and said, just for your information, there's some orca whales on the port side of the ferry. And uh, so I went down to the car deck and I said, oh, the artifacts are here. And oh, wow, the whales are here. <laughs> and we're all going home together. So uh, uh, big, state, big cultural statement to us is about 2013 that occurred. Um, that uh, we were very proud of the fact that uh, Southern Resident Killer Whales came out and, uh, you know, we're honoring the fact that our culture was being restored and resurg our culture is resurging. And uh, they're looking for the same thing that uh, we are looking for, and that's more food, less toxics, less vessel traffic, so that we can all uh, harvest in unison. So um, i just like to thank you for this opportunity opportunity for us to be together and, and get creative on how we address this this and the many other issues we face here in the Northwest and salmon recovery. Chad, I'm finished. Apologies to those on Zoom. Um, not quite sure what's going on, but we got you back on, you can hear, you can see. Uh, sorry about that, hopefully it wasn't too long. <clears throat> so we're going to move right along. And um, up next, I would like to ask for a representative from the Coeur d'Alene Tribal Council to come forward. Following Coeur d'Alene, we'll have Ms. Squally on deck. Just to note, we do have over 80 participants on our Zoom right now, including at least seven congressional districts um, listening in. And we are also on the Nez Perce Tribes Facebook Live. And we have, I believe, close to 80 folks there too. Um, feel free to share that link if you do have your Facebook pages available and hopefully won't have any more glitches. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Hemi James, and I'm here uh, representing uh, not only the Coeur d'Alene people, but uh, my country, uh, my land, my water, and all the relatives that uh, share that uh, homeland with me. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Squawk, uh, he got up, but thanks to our host, Squawk's an island nation, um, beautiful facility, beautiful country, always nice to be on this side of the mountains and uh, 
smell that fresh air and uh, uh, beautiful golf course. I donated many balls yesterday out on the, to the land uh, more than I wanted to, but um, thank you for having us uh, here um, from all of the representatives here at the Coeur d'Alene. Um, I got the unique perspective uh, to share with you all uh, um, what we're here to talk about. And that's the, the worried uh, and the uh, urgency to uh, keep the salmon runs that are uh, currently, currently still available in, in this great land of ours. My people have been, I've been without salmon for nearly a century. So you guys want an example of uh, what you're trying to uh, stop from happening. Here we are. This is what happens when the salmon are gone. Not only the substance of eating it, uh, not only the songs and the, the cultural aspects of it, but the very essence of our being is the salmon. All of us, that's what we share to those here, those on Zoom. And when that gets taken, the people can never be whole again until those salmon are returned, until those salmon are uh, the, the essential primary focus of our, our beings. And my people are relegated to getting fish out of the back of a truck. We have to look at our neighbors when they have excess fish given to us. From all, you look at historical uh, pictures of the Indians standing in line to get their rations. That's what my people are relegated to. Waiting for our neighbors to give us 50, 100, 200 fish that we can get out of the back of a truck. So you all that have salmon, you should be freaking out and excuse my language, you should be downright crapping your pants because you don't want to end up like us. So it's good, and I think Shannon, he's been pushing this and getting us all together over the last uh, year or so to get this uh, subject out to the rest of the world, that they can understand our peril, that we ain't looking for uh, um, tourism, we ain't looking to uh, make extra money, we're trying to hang on to that little bit of our lives that uh, still exists what our ancestors sacrificed so much for, this little window and little piece of our traditional way of life. So I uh, applaud uh, Congressman Simpson for getting this uh, conversation started. We come together as uh, Indian nations and gosh, there's just so much infighting. <laughs> we, we try to get the uh, unified uh, front going out, but there's so much, in, uh, I heard it said by a number of leaders today, um, political perspectives and uh, different rights. But we have to look at this issue not as civil rights, not as human rights, not as treaty rights, not as executive order rights. We have to look at this as natural rights. The right to exist. And we've heard uh, many uh, leaders today talk about uh, uh, creation stories. We all have it in each one of our nations where when the humans were put here, the animals had a talk and how oh, we got to take care of this feeble being that is the humans because he can't take care of himself. So they gave themselves for us. And in here in the Northwest, that salmon was that uh, central being. I'll make the sacrifice so that this feeble being <laughs> can make it. Now it's our opportunity to sit here amongst ourselves and sacrifice our own political views, our own strong feelings to sacrifice of ourselves so that that salmon can exist. It's our turn to hold up that part of the bargain, that natural order, that natural right to exist. So I hope that to the nation sitting here, the nation's listening, that we can put all that uh, selfishness aside. I'm guilty of it myself. What are we gonna get out of it? What's the Coeur d'Alene tribe gonna get out? What's Hemi gonna get out of it? We have to take that selfishness out 
take the, whether you're a treaty tribe, executive order tribe, whether you're not even federally recognized, whether you're a dang uh, Alaskan corporation, we're all indigenous. We all have that right to exist. We all need to make that sacrifice somewhere in this uh, colonial mind frame. We've uh, um, thought of ourselves as uh, overseeing the natural world. We've come to that arrogance that is today's man of uh, it's, the land is here for us to use. No, we're just a piece of it. it. Don't matter what the federal government document was signed. It don't matter whether you made an agreement or whether uh, they made the agreement and gave it to you. Whether you had to form a corporation to be uh, recognized by the federal government. We're all indigenous people. And it's gonna take the sacrifice of each one of our individual nations to ensure that the salmon exists. Because without the salmon, let me tell you, it's a pretty, it's a pretty lonely world. Not just for us, the human existence of uh, the human beings in my country, but the waters, they're not whole. The riparian zones, they're not whole. The birds that fly that used to feed on the fish, they're not whole and they never will be until those salmon are returned. So we have to look at not only opening up certain veins of the water system, we have place was the uh, Spokane Falls, right downtown Spokane. Some of the biggest, re biggest fish that we return in, uh, in the entire world, right in our backyard. It's been nearly a century since the fish came up there. So I appreciate what you those nations out there that have the fish, I can tell you, you don't want to be where we're at. You better step up. We all better step up and we better take our personal agendas out of everything. We better take our personal stake out of everything and we better do what's right and accept personal responsibility for ensuring that the salmon has its right to live. And I hope, I hope by Congressman Simpson starting this conversation, and uh, it's a hell of a conversation to start up. It's uh, been talked about in the back room for a long time, longer than I've been walking the face of this earth. But I applaud him for uh, throwing it out to the rest of the world, out in the open. It takes a lot of heart. Excuse the language, but a lot of stones to uh, um, bring that up. And I, I don't think that there's a nation in here that wouldn't support any aspect of speaking dam removal. My nation doesn't, uh, doesn't oppose anything in regards to opening the waterways up. The day is gonna come where the conversation has to happen though, of opening that entire system open the entire Columbia River, because we have nations, First Nations up north that uh, have, are in the same boat I, I am, haven't had salmon in a century. And if we truly want to set this course down and set this land to heal, eventually that conversation is going to have to happen. So I appreciate everyone uh, listening to me. Sorry if I got a little long-winded there, but... Um,
indigenous relatives. So I hope this momentum carries forth and keeps on going. Whatever uh, my nation can do to uh, set this road on, uh, we're prepared to do it. Thank you very much. Shukmaiski. My name is Sluskum. My English name is Virgil Lewis Sr. I am a member of the Yakima Nation. I am the vice chairman for the Yakima Nation Tribal Council. And I am a lifetime fisherman on the Columbia River and the Yakima River. This is Yakima Nation's testimonial. <clears throat> The Yakima Nation is a sovereign federal recognized nation pursuant to its inherent and the natural and cultural resources that they sustain. In our longhouse feasts, we sit at ceremonial table waiting for the water to be poured. Next, the salmon is placed on the table, followed by the deer, roots, and berries. We complete the meal with water. We are taught this order and that water is the lifeblood of our existence. The relationship between the people and the salmon in the Columbia River Basin is the foundation of time-honored laws of the Yakima Nation. The Yakima Nation accepts responsibility as a steward of the salmon in the Columbia River. As a co-manager,
not at the expense of tribal resources and rights. I say that on behalf of Yakima Nation. At the last AT&I conference that was held, I'd mentioned to the AT&I tribes present that Yakima Nation was in the process of buying a farm. Yesterday, we concluded that process. Currently, Yakima Nation owns a farm of 2,000 acres, very productive farm that we are going to operate and run on behalf of Yakima Nation and work with other tribes to help with the needed food boxes that are provided in the Northwest. We also have our own power company that has been in operation for over 10 years and is doing very, very well. So with this legislation that is being proposed, it is going to impact the accommodation to a degree, but we are supporting it 100%. On behalf of the accommodation, I thank you for your And I apologize, we are having some internet issues. So our uh, Zoom and Facebook Live does is going in and out, but we're working to get it fixed. Well, good morning. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit late. This meeting, I it was on a couple of conference calls I couldn't get away from. So, um, so uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ron Allen, uh, Chair CEO for the... I, Leonard and, and Terry and others who helped put this together. I want to compliment the Congressman uh, for uh, such a very um, ambitious and progressive um, initiative um, to uh, try to restore the salmon. Uh, without a doubt, um, um, restoring the salmon is, is important to all of our cultures. We in the Northwest, um, it is a part of who we are, what we're all about. I know that all the testimonies listening to Virgil and, and and uh, others that who have already been testifying why salmon is so important to our indigenous world, uh, that why it's important to all of us throughout the Northwest. I'm a commissioner um, on the U.S. Canada Pacific Salmon, and uh, McCoy Oatman from Nespers um, is uh, uh, with me as a past generations and all of our elders uh, who have shared with us why it is so important. It is complicated um, and we all know it's complicated. Um, I come from over in the Olympic Peninsula, west of Seattle, in Leonard's territory, um, and um, uh, our sister tribe, Lower Elwha, led the, champ led the, uh, the campaign to remove two dams um, on the Elwha River to restore historic uh, uh, Chinook uh, stocks that was uh, you know, got up to well over 100 pounds. Uh, and these were very impressive salmon. And those two dams uh, basically took away from them, from that broodstock, um, the importance of that salmon. 
now that those two dams are removed, those the adverse stock is coming back, um, that it can happen. But it was complicated. It was a 20-year journey. And we know that the congressman's uh, uh, initiative uh, to uh, rope in his colleagues on the Senate side and, and, uh, on, and throughout the House, um, it, that is going to be challenging because they all have a special interest. Uh, I was listening to Virgil point out the fact that, you know, that ag industry, timber industry, the transportation industry, uh, the, those who need the power that comes from these different dams, um, they're all threatened and they all have concerns. We know that. We've been down that trail. We know what it's like. We know how complicated it is. Uh, we know that it's not just an Indian agenda, but we find ourselves in Indian country being the leader, bringing people to be, have a comfort level of um, that where we have a solution. There can be a solution. There are alternatives. There are ways in order to responsibly and respectfully address the other interests. And, and you have to find a way to bring everybody to the table so that we're all comfortable, just so that we trust each other. And building that trust is easy. I'm sure the Congressman knows about that. They work overtime, uh, you know, back in DC, trying to cross the aisle on many, many issues. But there are many issues with that, that, that the R's and D's find common ground. They do clasp hands. Things do get done. So set aside political perspectives um, or, or, uh, or uh, uh, objective perspectives, there are ways for, for us to have a common vision. And that's what this initiative is, that the Nez Perce is advocating and the Congressman is advocating, and, and we wanna be a part of that. We wanna be a part of that journey. It won't happen overnight. And it is not cheap. It's gonna be costly at coming up with these alternative solutions that, that addresses everybody's needs. And uh, we certainly have our experience out in our territory, and uh, it can be done. Uh, there, are, uh, there are bumps in the road or in the trail, you know, that we have to figure out how to get around them, how to get people to get comfortable um, and, and, uh, and understand that we understand. So as we are advocating for um, making this happen, the question is, is how we navigate around um, the, the, those bumps in the trail that, that we will experience. Um, because salmon is what we're all about. Uh, salmon is, 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 is so ingrained in the cultural values of indigenous people, but non-Indian people too. They care about it. They care about the salmon too. Um, and so, you know, we, we gotta find ways that we can lock arms and join hands, if you will, um, to make this thing happen. Um, and, it, and we've got all kinds of reasons for to be distracted. Uh, all kinds of diversions that, that we will experience. Um, but, we, but as long as we stay committed and focused and persistent, um, we can make this happen. This is not just a liberal perspective. This is not just an environmental perspective. It's a perspective about a Northwest resource that everybody in this room and many of our, our, our friends outside of this room care about. And, and, we, and it's a big deal to us to make this thing happen. So Jamestown uh, has, has been a big uh, uh, advocate for this. Uh, we have our own successes uh, in our backyard. We have the Dungeness River. Uh, little by little, you know, we're, we're, we're acquiring property and removing dikes. And so dams aren't the only problem. Sometimes the man over the course of our, our history decided they wanted to straighten the rivers out. Well, nature says that's not smart. Yeah, yeah, that was a dumbass thing that that, that non-Indian world did. And yeah, you smile, it's funny, isn't it? You kind of go, okay. Uh, and even we, uh, in our growth of, 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 of becoming more self-reliant and self-governing for our own people, we're developers too. We're developers, we build homes, we build businesses. Um, so we have, we have things that we're doing that can be challenging to the environment, but it's about finding that balance. When, when we, were, we started our casino near a, a, a very important creek that, that had endangered uh, 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 coho and, and, um, and chum fisheries in our area, and we were planning on uh, this resort, and we bought all this property around this creek, and so we were, had this, all these development plans. Our natural resource people came to us and said, we got a better idea. We're going to reroute that creek back to its traditional route so the salmon can come back and they have a home. 
And so we, the tribe, said, okay, better idea. Element, but a better idea was salmon because salmon is who we are, and that's more important than this economic development. And so th those are choices that, that we find ourselves being challenged in Indian country, wherever we are. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, wh wherever we are, we find ourselves making those right choices. And that's the challenge for us as leaders. That's the choice that, that Congress has to engage. And that's the choices that, that our, our um, other interest groups who care about power, the cities, the towns, uh, the ag industry, the timber industry, we're gonna find balance for the salmon for a way of life that's so important to us. So Jamestown is with you guys. We, we, we truly believe it. We, we wanna raise our hands to, to all of you who, who are champions, who do your part. That's what we're doing. We're doing our part. Everybody's got to do their part. So um, we don't all have to flood into uh, Congressman Simpson's office, but we'll, we'll, he'll find times and find ways to make, to make it happen uh, so that we're championing and also to work as colleagues, and including on the Senate side. We appreciate Senator Murray um, is here and, uh, and can't well, you know, that, that we uh, um, need to work everybody. And I can tell you, Alaska has a dog in this fight. So Alaskan senators, Alaska congressmen, they, they have a dog in this fight because the fisheries are all connected from Alaska to the upper reaches of, of Snake River. So anyhow, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, we want to help do our part and, uh, and we'll be there for, for you and, and for this, this campaign. Um, we'll probably have many of these over the number, next number of years uh, in order to move this agenda forward. Thank you, I'm very honored. I'd like to next call on a representative from the Puyallup tribe. On deck, we will have the Spokane tribe. I'd like to say Oxlo Hale, James Jim Jim Rideout from the Puyallup Tribal Council. And it's an honor and a privilege to speak here at AT&I about something so near and dear to each and every one of us. Uh, being a commercial fisherman the majority of my life, born in 1970, uh, just before the Bolt decision, when we got 50% of our rights back. I know my elders were upset that we lost 50% of our rights, but it's been a struggle. And the struggle the Puyallup tribe faces today is a dam that uh, they had put uh, turf into our, our waters and our upper watersheds. It's very detrimental to us at this point because that dam is, is going to kill thousands and thousands of salmon for our future. We're all faced with these issues. And I, re I remember uh, Sylvia you know, coming back and talking about the dams and the removals of dams and people wanted to negotiate about, you know, we have to negotiate. Absolutely not, Sylvia said. She, she come back and she had said, we're gonna fight this case, the culvert case. And in that culvert case, we stood up as tribes collectively and together and beat that case. So this is the infrastructure that needs to take place for each and every one of our tribes today as we work together for our future of our children. I've had the honor and the privilege to fish alongside of one of the most prestigious women's son in the whole Puyallup tribe, that's Ramona Bennett's son, Eric Bennett. He died. He died of cancer. He died doing what he loved the most. I remember the last time he fished, he was out on that water and the creator gave him enough salmon before he left this world and, and allowed him to transition with that way of life. We live in the Puyallup River system in the interior of the Puget Sound and we suffer a lot. We live in a super, super fun site and my mother had died of cancer. I'm a stage four cancer survivor. And so when you talk about the health of the welfare of, of our people, 
Those are the things that I think about. How do we restore all of these things collectively working together to make sure we have the health and welfare and the benefit for our future and for our children? My Uncle Robert Satyakam and Chester Satyakam told me one day you're going to be up here speaking. Oh, double there A. I am. Okay. See, I'm I'm speaking this, uh, in behalf so you know, of the PLA oh, yeah. people, and it's an it's honor and a privilege, but the work needs to shirt? be done. Huh? You see their shirt? We need yeah. to put our fish yeah. pens yeah. down. We're not talking yeah, farm-raised fish. We're talking we about staging our fish. Oh, we used yeah, to have staged great. fish in many areas, in our, and it works. Release them. I honestly believe under what it's been presenting to us under the models of the state of Washington is why we're at in the situation that we're at today. It has to stop. We have to change the ways that we're doing things for the sake of our future of our salmon. You have the Canadians that are taking hundreds of permits out. Why? Because they're feeling the effect too. Do we have to shut down as Washington State and look at ways to restore our salmon runs? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We are put here to protect the nations of salmon and that is our responsibility as leaders. I just wanna say thank you yeah. for giving the opportunity to speak for my tribe today. You know, and thank you very much. I'd like to welcome Danny Keeper with the Spokane Tribe. And on deck, we have the a representative from the Quailute Tribe. Uh, good morning, and I'd like to thank uh, Squawks and Island and Chairman Peters for the for hosting us here today. Thanks for inviting us to your homeland. Uh, yeah, like you know, the Spokane Tribe, we're like the Coeur d'Alene. You know, we stand in line to get our salmon out of a blue tote. You know, we we have a lot of fishermen. Uh, we're grateful. You know, we're grateful for the salmon from you know the Colville Tribe and you know the Clickitat and you know the Icicle. Um, but yeah, we would like to get salmon above the blocked areas. Uh, I'm just going to read a statement here. The Spokane tribe of Indians is heartened by Congressman Simpson, courage to recognize and continue flawed approach the federal government, federal government has used in addressing the environmental impact of the federal Columbia River power system to date. A system that has produced immense wealth for the Columbia River region at the expense of the salmon, steelhead and the lamprey, that the Spokane tribe and many other tribes in the Columbia River Basin rely upon. Until the construction of Grand Coulee Dam, although the proposal headlines with the removal of the four Snake River dams, Congressman Simpson proposal could spread an implementation of returning salmon, steelhead and lamprey to the upper Columbia River. Addressing the impact to the Columbia River Basin in a holistic way will require the region and its political leaders to display the same courage. Congressman Simpson has displayed in releasing his proposed framework. Many details will be needed to be worked through and many hearts and minds won over. However, acknowledging the system is not working for the entire region is a big step forward. The Spokane Tribes Reservation is located on the confluence of the Columbia and the Spokane River above Grand Coulee Dam. The construction of the Grand Coulee Dam and the much smaller Little Falls Dam on the Spokane River cut off the upper Columbia region from salmon, steelhead and lamprey. The Spokane Tribe, along with many others, have been working on the Northwest Power and Conservation Council phased approach to reintroduce salmon and steelhead to the upper Columbia River since 2014. Our collective work can be found at UCUT's webpage. Salmon and steelhead reintroduction into the his, historic habitat above Grand Coulee Dam will benefit the entire region. As our work so far indicates, successful reintroduction can occur without impacts to the current beneficiary provided by Grand Coulee, 
dam and hydropower, flood control and irrigation. Truly a win-win. We encourage all the region's political leaders to work together to ensure that any legislation passed will benefit the entire Columbia River region. So yeah, it's, it's you know, like, you know, the salmon is very important to our tribe. Uh, we, you know, our, our tribe, we can heal. All tribes that, you know, in the blocked area can heal when we get the salmon above the blocked areas. So I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you. Next, I'd like to call up a representative from the Quileute tribe. And coming up is Chairman Douglas Woodruff, Jr. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to our ho host over here, um, uh, Chairman Peters, uh, for opening up your lands to us and uh, always treating us very well when we come here for all the events. Um, hot she good morning, everyone. Haley um, Kulaleo. Salalali Kuliut Tisqua, Kulaali Douglas Woodruff Jr., Echechio Litli, Wasalia Hoi, Lieska Ho Kwashta. My name is Doug Woodruff Jr. I am a, a member of the Kuliut tribe. I am actually the chairman. I'm part of the council here. Um, I want to thank our host again for uh, allowing us to be here today for this uh, very special occasion. Um, this was kind of a last minute thing uh, that popped up on the radar for me. So I had a feel, you know, I had a feeling I, I, I need to be here. Um, so I didn't really have anything prepared to, to say, but, you know, I'm just going to shoot from the hip as you know, like we we're called upon to do from time to time. Um, you know, I come from a long line of fishermen. Uh, I am a river fisherman, commercial fisherman for the last 25 years. I have witnessed and seen the decline of salmon fishing in my area. Um, I'm also a part of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. You know, I do attend the, the meetings with a, a few of the guys here in the crowd, you know, and we, we sit there and we, you know, we fight with the state quite a bit, the state of Washington, as we see our decline of fish going down every year. Um, there's a lot of problems with the system that I could see. Um, the state, they show up from time to time with unrealistic goals, uh, numbers of fish they want to take from us every year. Uh, we, we show up, we fight for what we believe is ours. And it's a shame to see a lot of the tribes here today that don't have any fish. You know, I am one of the blessed tribes right now to have fish at my table. Um, a lot of the events that go on to our neighboring tribes as far as funerals, celebrations, you know, just get togethers, they can't even have fish for their meal. This is a shame. As the, as the, the, uh, the man over here spoke earlier about uh, having to get fish off the back of a truck. You know, we never wanna see that where we're from. You know, we, we, we give a lot of fish away from our area. You know, we're, we're trying to protect what's ours, but when Washington State doesn't show up to the table with a, a correct mind, you know, we have to fight them. You know, all at these Northwest Indian Fish Commission meetings, they show up with unrealistic numbers asking, basically um, wanting to take a lot of fish without even, without even asking the tribes consulting with us uh, what would be best for the systems. You know, when you show up and you wanna take, 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 and then you leave the responsibility to the tribes, it's not a good thing. You know, we can only do so much. You know, we come here, we fight, we try to protect what's ours. We try to keep what's ours, you know. As I said, the people from where I'm from have fished since time immemorial. You know, all we can do is protect that. The orcas, uh, that's another big problem, you know. The orcas come in our river system about once every 10 years. Uh, a few weeks ago, they have returned into our river system looking for fish, looking for stuff to eat. As a commercial fisherman, you know, I'm out on the ocean from time to time. 
and I do see the orcas pass by, you know, and I'm wondering to myself, how far do these orcas got to travel to find food? You know, there's a lot of trolling out in front of my area with nobody catching any fish the last few weeks. So everybody's moving down the coast. So where do the orcas go? What are they eating? You know, why are they in our river system? They are all looking for something to eat. You know, we, we got to take control of this and try to get a, a grasp on um, the fish, the way things are brought to the table. You know, it's a, uh, I know I'm a good pain in the States uh, behind when we sit at these tables and fight because, you know, that's what I'm put here for. I'm, I'm here to protect what's ours and make sure, you know, we take care of all our natural resources. Another thing that really makes me mad is when the state shows up and they say, we want this amount of fish. My first question is, what are you gonna give us in return? What are you guys doing for the habitat? What are you doing for, you know, all the streams? I know where I'm from, we have lots of habitat and I'm blessed with that. But I know a lot of the tribes, you know, and towards the cities, they don't, they're not, they just don't have that habitat. You know, so when the state shows up and they want, want, and want, you know, what are you giving back? You know, what are you guys preparing to, to leave on the table or what are you giving back to our future? You know, another thing is uh, a lot of people around here don't have the right mind when they sit at the table and uh, the state, you know, for example, last year we closed down due to COVID. And then uh, next thing you know, a few weeks later, the governor shut down fishing. You know, because everybody was in the same boat, everybody was everywhere, and nobody was doing social distance. Well, that was all great and fine for a couple of weeks until people started complaining. You know, as they say, it is our right to fish. You know, it's everybody else's privilege. Well, somewhere down the line, the privilege said, you know, it is now our right to fish. But when they take, take, and take, and they don't put nothing back, you know, there's, there's a big problem there. You know, we can only protect so much as tribes. We can only do so much as tribes. When the state doesn't kick in and do their part, there's a big problem. So, you know, when we have these meetings from time to time, you know, I, I, do, I do get on the state quite hard, um, but that's my job, you know. We're here to protect, protect, and protect. We gotta make sure there is future and fishing for our people. You know, there should be fish on everybody's plates. There should be a fish in every community, but there's not. You know, and my heart feels sad for them tribes that don't have fish. You know, we used to be really blessed with fishing. We used to fish five days a week on our river system. We are now down to two days a week. When our guys, our, our, uh, our fisheries techs see something wrong with the fish numbers coming in, you know, we're the first ones to close our river system. We don't need nobody to tell us. We know something's going wrong. You know, in the state, <sighs> They just don't understand that part. Um, when every river system in Washington state closes down, our river system stays open. And without consultation to our rivers, to our tribe about, you know, pushing everybody to our system, you know, that's a big problem. Nobody asks us, hey, can you guys have a couple thousand people on your river system? You know, our river system's pretty small, but the fish are plentiful. They were plentiful. You know, our numbers are going down across the board. You know, and I'm here to fight for what I believe in, what we have at home. But when the state comes up and they take, take, take with no accountability, you know, they would look at us and close us down in a heartbeat if we didn't have the proper enforcement or the numbers for fish, anything our fish tech guys do for us, they'd shut us down in a heartbeat. But then again, they stand to stay open. They have no enforcement on our area. I live in a very remote area. You know, we're lucky to have one guy that, uh, uh, enforcement officer that comes out and patrols the whole West End, which is a very big place. You know, so the state needs to be held accountable on their end as well. You know, we, like I said, we can't do all the work here. We, we protect, protect, protect. We try to leave future fish for our, the next seven generations, but it's a, it's a tough thing to do, you know? So I just want to say thank you to everybody here today and, uh, you know, we need to all stick together and keep up the good fight for all the tribes that are actually looking for fish that are trying to breach these dams. You know, the dams new need to come down. You know, I've sat at a lot of meetings for fisheries in the last five years since I've been in this position. And, you know, it's, it's a tough deal. You know, you got to keep fighting. It's a long process, I understand. But as long as we don't give up and we keep fighting, you know, there will be fish for the future.
Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite up Chairman Roswell Klein with the Nooksack Tribe. If you're here. Do we have any other tribes with tribal leader representatives that would still like to come forward? Yeah, come on up. And coming forward, we have Liwan with the Shoshone Bannock tribe. How you doing, Mike? Um, everyone, uh, just like to echo what everybody said. And thank you for this great hospitality, Little Creek, beautiful place here. Uh, my name is Lee Wong Tyler, Shoshone Bannock Tribes. Uh, my Indian name is Dupambi. And my Indian name, Dupambi, means black hair, named after uh, my great great grandfather, is the Chief Tindoy from the Agaidika band up there, uh, Salmon, Salmon River country. Salmon, Idaho, and some of you guys might know it. And the Coeur d'Alene's are our neighbors over there. Good to see Ernie and all these guys. And it's been, a, I've been on the council since 2005 to show them Bannock tribes and worked my way up. But I never was chairman. I don't know why, but I guess it's better not to be. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, you know, I, I do the cultural part. I speak the language and uh, like the, my, my uh, staff over there too, Dan Stone and Chad Coulter, they're really... Uh, Mr. Metal in uh, providing great, uh, great uh, insight to perspectives of this great uh, dormant fish species of the salmon, our relatives, Scott Hauser as well. I'm part of the Upper Snake River Tribes, uh, chairman. I'm a chairman for that. But uh, that's uh, four tribes down there, blocked areas of the hell below the Hell's Canyon complex. Mike Simpson knows where that's at. And I think some of you guys do too. Shan and all these guys, but that's another huge area in this Columbia River Basin. And besides the areas over here where Leonard and all these guys live, and I visited the areas over here. I drove through here one time, coming up here to be to see and view this uh, country of the uh, affiliate tribes, uh, affiliate tribes of the Northwest to see what it's about. I traveled how many times to check out every area, seeing the big the battlefields of Big Hole and. Uh, over there, white bird and coming down that hill. I went over to the Coeur d'Alene many times and to check out these reservations. Yakima, I stopped there as well. Yakima Nation. So I've been to different areas. I've been to Canada in my time to see what it's like. And, and then I visited and I've been to this Columbia River Treaty negotiation meetings to see what they're about. And then I've been representing and listening and listening and I wonder when, when are we going to take action? It's really it's a it's a great time now. It's just really awesome that Mike's here. Uh, want to want to propose that bold action to take action finally. It's a long time coming. And a lot of the blocked areas and the, the Hell's Canyon complex is not even mentioned because so, certain individuals of Idaho are opposed to things. Not to uh, no offense to uh, the governor over there, Brad Little, but uh, how, how, why is he not? supporting the Columbia River Tree negotiations to bring back salmon in those Hell's Canyon complex, even though it's so polluted over there. There's the Oxbow, Oxbow Reservoir, the Brownlee, the Hell's Canyon. The Oxbow, 65 miles of length of pollution, almost sewage. Some of you guys have never been there. We went on a jeep boat ride over there one time though, Hell's Canyon area and checked that out, a beautiful place. And there's still steelhead that go there on, the, on, on that part of the Snake River. And uh, I'm from the Shoshone Bannock tribes, and they call us New Winnet, and what we call ourselves New Winnet. Banait uh, is Bannock. Ba means water in our language, like this bottled up water right here. Ba means water. Night uh, is from. That's what the Bannocks are. Banait uh, means from people from the water. 
but the, the Indians in Canada call us bannock bread. They come in, they go, hey, I want some bannock. And it, but it, I don't know where that came from, but it, they, 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 te they, they tease each other about bannock bread, they, but they don't know the real meaning. And bannock, it means bannockwat. In our, in our language, Shoshone is a Sosoni. New one uh, means people from the grass. And then, but throughout time, in time of memorial, I guess, our people start calling us all these names. And eventually, we ended up being called the snakes from the tribes, the Blackfeet tribes and other tribes. And then the Snake River was named after us, Snake Territory. And that's, that's where we're, we're, we're part of the, the um, big nation. Comanches are way down south. They're a part of us too. Speak the same language. They went down there. Paiutes are the same as Bannocks. So the Paiutes, they were over, all, the, all, all the way over to the coast with the, with the Modocs and the Klamath. They were over there. And then, and then some of them are living with the Warm Springs tribes now. So uh, there, there's a lot of history everybody has. But I just want to share a little bit so people can understand from up here, from Leonard, and these guys don't know about us. Ron Allen, a lot of those guys don't really know about our history. And we, we know a lot about everybody's history, like, like the Nest Purse. We hear about Nest Purse War and all this, and what with the atrocities that came forth. We had our own, all the tribes that you know have. I, I studied history. And we had a Bear River massacre down there in our area. Over 400 of our people were wiped out, massacred in 1863. But you know, all these things come to play to now. So I don't want to take too much time, but I just want to share something the different perspective of this it's a long time coming that there's there's more to this than just this uh, this this system that needs protection it's the whole environment it's the air it's everything below it's uh, life as it is as, as we know it and we just got out of a sundance me and our chairman Devin, and we just got out of a, a ceremony that's called dagawuna in our language that dancing for thirst standing for thirst Two of our other uh, council members were in there. Lad Edmo was current chairman. He was in there too. Roland Marshall. We fasted from Friday to Monday without food and water because we're praying for the water. We're praying for the salmon. Because there's a story in, our, in, our, in our, our language too. Before the humans came, the animals spoke. And then it was part of that. So someday if there's no more salmon, it's in that time. That's a prophecy. We're almost to that time. We don't want that. We don't want the man to end, but it's, it's, that's going to happen. A prophecy, Nostradamus predicted a prophecy. So I don't know if we want to go that far, but that's where we're at. Someday when the salmon no longer exists, it's going to be in the time. That was a prophecy. And then there was another prophecy where it was uh, unique to uh, some of other, well, somebody else mentioned that the uh, salmon, um, people were in a, fam a famine and starving when the salmon came and, and I'm this human was praying and praying and praying. And he said, how do I help my people? Creator turned him into a salmon. He said, you're going to go to the ocean and come back and save your people. And that was a prophecy in our language. There's so many uh, stories and, um, and uh, legends of our people before humans came. So I just want to share a little bit and then for our children. And we got, we're losing our languages right now, too. That's, 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 that's really, that has to go into this part of this. And uh, I guess uh, the money part, uh, that's the, the, the bold action too. We need education and we need our own tribal lands to help, help preserve our forest, our forest lands. And our, we have a treaty with the United States. And I just came from uh, Fort Bridger last Saturday, July 3rd. That was when our treaty was signed with the government, peace treaty with the United States. So we're one of the lucky tribes that have a treaty off reservation rights. We have our tribal members right now harvesting salmon and the last few remaining over there in the Salmon River country over there, Middle Fork and those areas, South Fork and those areas down there. And some of you guys know about the Nest Purse, know about the areas, Sawtooth and the hatcheries. We need more money for hatcheries. That's another one. We need more funding for hatcheries out there. And uh, we, we need our own hatcheries as tribes, Shishombanic people as well, others. We, we, could, we could help utilize the infrastructure we need funds for all these things and um, environment to save the riparian areas. There's so much more we could add. And, but I think we have a proposal as well as other tribes to help use this, utilize this money to offset some of the other things that are need, uh, needed out there. The recreation people and, 
the, the farming, uh, our, uh, agriculture people, all these people that's putting barge going going across over there with barge barging things to the cities. And then uh, I like what Ron Allen said. Oh, somebody mentioned something about Elway, Elwa River, when they took out those dams. So people were in panic. Hey, it's going to destroy a culture of a modern culture. But then when they were, they didn't think of the consideration. It was natural. So, but when that occurred, now it's okay. Everybody likes it now. Hey, it was, you, you got to learn to adapt. And it was natural. But one thing I, I heard when he was going to these Columbia River Treaty negotiation meetings was, Portland is in a flood zone. So the flood, and if we take out those dams, it might flood the whole city. Is that true? We don't know. So that there's a lot of issues going on here. There's a lot of different issues on all different angles, aspects of it. So you got to figure out, hey, what's the best thing to balance it? And then we got to balance it. That's where we're at. How do we balance it? And that's where uh, Simpson has that plan. And then people think, oh, he's against this. He's against hydropower. No, he's not. He wants to find a way to offset it because we need it, obviously. We need it somehow, but at the same time, there's new energy. I don't know if we could use nuclear energy. Perhaps we can. There's reactors over there. Uh, the people are coming up with scientific technology, the STEM projects for the youth. They're so smart now. We could ask, we need more money for them, more funding for our, our youth so they could uh, help save our future. We just got to take all everybody unified. Like my chairman said, no matter what color your blood is, our blood runs red, right? But I don't know if I want some of your blood in mine. Thank you. That's all I want to say for now. Do we have any other tribal representatives, tribal leader representatives here today that would like to speak? Okay, so up next, I'm gonna go ahead and bring forward the Nez Perce Tribe Vice Chairman, Shannon Wheeler, and we'll provide you with the Nez Perce testimony. Uh, Kehlani, and uh, our chairman, uh, Sam Penny is uh, in the audience too. Sam, if you could raise your hand too as well, uh, stand up, there you go, Sam. Uh, Sam has been the chairman for the Nez Perce Tribe uh, since May of, of this year. He's been doing a great job in uh, senior leadership. I'm very uh, honored to serve uh, as vice chairman uh, with Mr. Penny as, as the chairman and has shown great leadership. So uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to speak today uh, with uh, our chairman's blessing to, to allow uh, myself to continue the efforts of uh, uh, with Congressman Simpson and his proposal. So I'd just like to start with a few words of our language uh, as, we, as we try to practice as much as we can, uh, when we can and where we can. So, Tatsmewi Oikolohim Yuma, Kia Tatawatis Squaxen, So Yokuts Ki Lahin Haniwat, Wako Payats Tatsamina Namipu. Enum waswanik titoka tempt we we oaked pu namipu. I'd just like to wish everybody a good morning. Thank the Creator for this sacred land, Squaxin Island, and also for this beautiful day. So yakutski lahin haniwat because we're not always granted tomorrow. So thank the Creator for this beautiful day, and also. Wako Paiatsa Tots Temena Namipu. The Nez Perce come to you today with good hearts, with open hearts today, as we as we press forward and, and getting our voice out there and our united voice together as tribes out there speaking the truth. And that's what we're here today to do is, is to speak the truth. And just like to uh, thank all of our friends and family uh, for being here. Uh, today, Oikolohim Yuma. So I'd like to start, uh, you know, with uh, the proposal itself and the proposal of what it's, 
what it says. And, and I know Congressman Simpson uh, will have an opportunity today uh, to speak to that. But the, uh, the glimmer of light, the glimmer of hope, uh, which uh, he breathed back into uh, the years and years of fighting for uh, salmon recovery and uh, restoring salmon habitat and, and the natural spawners. And if you, as you've heard, you know, many of the, ha the hatcheries are needed and, and they will be needed. Uh, you know, as soon as we get uh, the dams removed and, and the uh, natural spawners back to healthy, harvestable, abundant numbers, there's still gonna be a need for hatchery because there's a commercial need. There's a, uh, a angler, sports anglers that fish for uh, these hatchery fish. So there is that need. And that's a large infrastructure piece there that, you know, as you know, all the tribes uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, are, are great fish managers and, and some of the largest, I mean, the Yakima Nation has the uh, largest uh, uh, fisheries uh, management uh, hatchery program there is, and the Nest Purse are right there, uh, uh, second to that. And, you know, the Pacific uh, Salish Sea Tribes as well, that, you know, a lot of the, the funding that they get and, and how each of the tribes over here are, are handling that. I mean, there's not enough funding for what we're doing. And as we speak to those hatcheries and and uh, restoration, you know, for, for us in this first country uh, that, you know, we've, we've done many things for hatchery restoration. We've done many things for uh, uh, the salmon out there that we could do. You know, we've, uh, we've obliterated roads, we've, you know, uh, fixed uh, waterways, uh, velocity barriers, just different things like that, that we've done to, to really help the salmon in, in all the ways that we could, you know, and, and in the face of climate change, uh, ocean conditions, the dams, you know, and it dates back even, even back to, uh, you know, overfishing early in the 1900s. That was, a, that was a part of the problem too. We can't pinpoint just one thing, but we know there's an accumulation of, of uh, many different things that are part of the problem. But as we, as we look uh, to the dials that we've turned and the dials that we speak of are those restoration projects uh, uh, to restore salmon's habitat and to, to uh, the different methods of, of trying to migrate fish, you know, barging and, and predation that, uh, that we work on to try to take out many of the predators uh, in, the, in the path of the migration of the juvenile salmon. You know, a lot of those dials have been turned to the, to the fullest. And so there's a need to turn some of the bigger dials and that's what breaching is. Breaching is turning uh, one of the uh, biggest dials that there are out there to help the uh, migration. So many of you are uh, familiar with the smolt to adult ratio, uh, the SARS. And in our area, you know, we're operating at about 1.5, but for healthy, harvestable, abundant numbers, we're looking at about 5% uh, of, of getting uh, that many salmon back. And, and we're far below that. So what uh, the action that needs to be taken now is in Congressman Simpson's proposal and br the breaching portion, it definitely ties to uh, many things. It ties to the water, which is where the salmon are. And, and as Congressman Simpson has said, and many of us have said too, is that, you know, we have, we as, as human beings have the ability to change. You know, salmon don't have that luxury. They don't have the luxury to change. Uh, and so it, as, as, we, as we try to turn these dials that we're talking about in that breaching piece that, that is uh, one, of the larger, one of the largest dials that, that we can control because we're not out there controlling the, the uh, ocean conditions. We can't do that. I mean, so this, uh, the conditions there even call for breaching even more now. So we have to do whatever we can now, not kick the can down the road, 
you know, 20 more years and study 20 more years. You know, I could be a consultant and I could study and tell you what you should do, but until you actually take action, when you take action and, and work to solve problems, that's when things are going to change. And that's what Congressman Simpson is proposing here. And so as we, as we look at uh, these uh, salmon returns, the migration, as we look at the spill agreement that we signed with the uh, Bonneville Power Administration to maximize the spill, to help uh, push the migrating salmon down the rivers, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, in our second, our third year now of that, our two, our two and a half years, I guess, uh, where we're at now. But that was all a part of the uh, Columbia River System of Operations uh, environmental impact statement uh, that the federal action agencies were doing. And that was that's uh, uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers, Bonneville Power Association, NOAA, and uh, Bureau of Reclamations. So, you know, the Nez Perce, you know, we go back to the 1990s, uh, you know, the Nez Perce uh, uh, passed a resolution uh, for um, uh, support of breaching dams, also filed litigation in the 1990s, joining uh, uh, an amicus curiae, a friend of the court uh, to that. So we fast forward then into 20. 2019 and and we had the uh water temperature uh kill off in 20 i think it was 2017 where the water in the snake river uh got too hot and it killed a lot of the salmon so we knew that time for action needed to take place so we we worked on a spill agreement with bonneville power administration and we stayed out of court we stayed out of court for a year that was our plan and, and the reason for that plan was so that science could take precedence because science is what we needed to solve these problems. Science and, and a lot of, of, of experience that uh, we, we've accumulated over the course of time. So then we expect a two year uh, Columbia River System of Operations plan to, to take place, but the former administration bumps it up a, a one year. So then now this, this time frame where science is supposed to be working best management practices and best available science is now crunched down into one year. So then we have a uh, an environmental impact statement that maybe has 19 pages of a 7,000 page document of on tribal social economic impacts to tribes. And, and we have uh, the biological opinion issued and the record of decision. And that's where we currently sit now. And, and that's where litigation sits with, uh, with the Oregon and as, as uh, the other tribes that have filed suit with, uh, with the state of Oregon and, and other uh, entities that are intending to so that's just a, a, something that I wanted to mention because of the fact that, you know, we're doing our part. We're doing our part to, to let science work, to look at the experience that we've had and to let technology be utilized to help this issue. And once again, that's what Congressman Simpson is proposing. He's looking at the past experiences. We as tribes are, are testifying to our experiences that we have. And science is supposed to take data and bring that forward, bring us facts and information so that we can formulate an opinion that is, that is the best decision to solve problems not just for one sector, not just for two sectors, but for all sectors. Once again, Congressman Simpson's proposal addresses all sectors. And through technology, we can change. We can change who we are. It goes back to what I said previously about we as humans can change. Fish, salmon, lamprey, steelhead, orca, they don't have the luxury 
that we do. I want to give an example, an analogy of, of uh, what I'm speaking to as well. Also, that uh, maybe some of the plateau tribes and, and coastal tribes can relate to because we all love huckleberries too. So in the face of climate change, huckleberries are, are changing and, and when they're ready. And some of the hot weather that we just experienced is, is changing the times and the, the weather patterns and how much water and how much snowpack is in these areas that huckleberries need to survive. Well, if you or I or anybody watching on Zoom get thirsty or get hot, we move. I can go down to the road and into the canyon and where it's cooler and move. Well, huckleberry is in the same in the same uh, um, line as salmon don't have that luxury. Their migration patterns take hundreds or thousands of years to be able to move. So those are the things that, that we're talking about when we talk about technology and climate change and the things that we have to do now. And that's the proposal. That's a proposal to bring the Northwest into the future, to bring the world into the future. And, that, and that's all we're trying to do is we're trying to solve problems together. We admit, I've said this many times, we admit we like to turn our lights on. We like to charge our phones. We like many things that electricity bring and anything that agriculture can bring to us as far as, as uh, uh, adding food to us and, and the, the economies that, that we all depend on as well. And we admit those things. I mean, the Nest Purse, we have solar. We have over 50,000 acres in agriculture land. We have recreation. We have tourism. And we have salmon. So we, we take this as a balanced approach of how we understand what the other sectors want and need, because we're a part of those sectors as well. So thinking about those words, uh, the experience in science and technology, you have to speak then to the testimonies of today the habitat, the restoration. And for me, I, um, I really feel uh, a lot of pain that uh, uh, council member uh, James from Coeur d'Alene expressed and how he expressed himself in the blocked area. I mean, I, I have a hard time imagining not fishing this year in the Snake River because of the lack of runs that, that uh, has come up. But to be without salmon for that many years, you also have, you know, the Southeastern Idaho tribes and the, the uh, uh, Southwestern Oregon tribes and, and other tribes that, have, that are in blocked areas. The Nez Perce are in a blocked area. We have Dwarshack Dam, we have Hills Canyon Dam where there's so much habitat out there that is available that where the salmon used to, used to come in, into the Snake River. And I don't know the numbers of the Salish Sea of, uh, because, you know, I mean, the habitat here is concrete now and a lot of their habitat has been covered that way. Ours, uh, our habitat out there is, is behind a lot of block dams and it's just difficult. It's very difficult to, to see what is missing. Uh, and it leads, it leads into another thing about the value of, of salmon and placing a value on salmon. Because many times, you know, if you're selling it by the pound or whatever, you're, however you're doing commercializing it, there's a value to it. Yeah, sure, there. But what about the value of catching a salmon? You're going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a picture here for you. 
uh, of my mother when she was five years old could uh, remember being in the South Fork of the Salmon River and watching the water. She said it was tidal waves coming up the river. So there was tidal wave after tidal wave coming up the river. And she goes, and that, and that was salmon. That was the backs of salmon coming up in such great numbers. It looked like the water was going backwards. And I, and I didn't witness that until I think 2003, when we had a pretty decent run back into the Salmon River. And I witnessed that for myself. And I could remember that. And I could remember being there when I was five years old with, with, my, with my family, with my mother and grandfather and father and all my brothers and sisters. So what I'm, what I'm going to say then is I experienced that relationship with my grandfather, my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, catching a salmon, cooking that salmon, sharing that salmon with one another. And in blocked areas, you can't, they haven't even experienced that for generations, for generations. It hurts my heart that, that uh, Shimmikin Creek and, and uh, up in Sandpoil and the other areas that are blocked back in behind Hell's Canyon, the Powder River and other places that are out there, that families aren't getting to experience that. Because I can tell you, we sang songs out there. I can tell you, we said prayers out there. I can tell you that we built relationships with one another and other families. And to be able to sit there with my grandfather, my, my father who are both gone and our mother, our mother is uh, 86 years old now, but to share those stories and that meal with all of my siblings, and there was 11 of us, so you had to get in line, uh, otherwise you're gonna miss out. But to share that story and to sit down and have a meal, share those prayers and those songs, you can't put a value on that. It's not a weighted value. It's priceless. Because I heard my grandfather's stories when he was five years old fishing in that same tributary and his grandfather that brought him there. That's the value of what blocked area tribes are missing. For generations, they could only hear their grandmothers speaking about what it was like. And they can't share that experience with their children. Therefore, sometimes, and we're natives, we know sometimes songs only come to us in certain places. Sometimes prayers only come to us in certain places. And that's what we're missing by not being able to be in those areas, to be able to share those stories and share those, those times and, 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 and build those characters with one another and, and instill those values in our young children. That's what's important. That's what's missing. That's the part of the value of salmon that, is, that isn't accounted for. All that and, and the nutrients that are not, no longer in the landscape or are dwindling in the landscape. That's why my heart goes out to those tribes that are behind blocked areas. So important to get fish passage back back to those tribes, back to those people, so they can become whole. So as I was speaking earlier, uh, also about the Columbia River systems of operations, the salmon restoration, the work that's being done out there, <clears throat> what it has done to us today, it has brought us together. It has brought us together in a common thread of salmon that we are here to share our stories with one another. 
And as we share our stories with one another, we can see that common thread between each and every one of us. Some of us have salmon, some of us don't have salmon, but we all want salmon. We all need salmon because it's part of who we are. So as we come together as tribes, we're united with the AT&I resolution and went to NCAI and a resolution passed there for the call, the call for, for this to come together and also for our Northwest delegation to take notice of, of the tribes, that uh, the tribes are united and the voices coming forward. And, you know, I, I heard, I heard somebody say this, I heard somebody say, well, you know, what if Congressman Simpson's proposal doesn't, doesn't go through, then what? Well, we're going to continue to fight. This fight has been going on for a long time and we're not going to go away. And you'll hear tomorrow from Chairman Willie Frank uh, from Nisqually, who happens to be the son of Billy Frank, which was who uh, during the fish wars was one of the great advocates for the salmon. And the fight for him, the next generation is still here, still fighting. So we ain't gonna go anywhere. So we do need to solve problems. We do need that Northwest delegation to listen to to, to work, not only with entities of energy, of agriculture, of recreation, but with the tribes and that obligation to the tribes and, and the trust responsibility that the, the, the uh, congressional delegation have. And the time for action is now. You know, as we speak to other, other great fishermen, orca, eagle, and all these other fishermen that are out there. And it was uh, my brother who got who uh, was viewing the Nisqually fisheries back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And he, he mentioned to one of the fishermen uh, of the Nisqually tribe, uh, um, he goes, wow, look at all those fishermen out there. And and, and uh, the Nisqually uh, tribesman goes, he goes, he was looking at all the, uh, the boats out there and he goes, yeah, there's quite a few out there. And he goes, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, look at the, uh, look at the eagles and, and look at the, uh, um, I think there might've been uh, an orca out there and, and other uh, um, animals out there that were fishing. He goes, those ones, he said, this must be the spot because they're all here. And so as, as, we, as we understand, you know, that uh, a lot of our prayers and songs come from uh, those animals and those creatures that are out there that are part of who we are, we must oftentimes reflect and look at them for the answers and look at their face because our face is the same. When there isn't no fish in there, our face is the same. We're searching around, as, as was said, an orca in the river looking for food. And we can do something about that. We can change that. But we can't wait till 30 years from now again. Let's talk for 30 more years about it, and then we'll decide to do something. There's no time for that. The time for action is now. I'd just like to thank Congressman Simpson again and, and thank uh, um, uh, Senator Murray's staff, Senator Crapo's staff for being here. And those uh, members that are listening online too as well, that you know they hear our stories, they hear uh, the fight that we have, that fight that the salmon have, fight that the orca have, steelhead and lamprey. I mean, we're the ones that changed the system. It wasn't them. 
I mean, I can come to your house and rearrange your house for you so you can't live. I mean, we wouldn't like that too much. So it's about time we step up and, and continue to, to let our voice be heard. For those people that are, are here that are willing to listen, that are willing to sit at the table and solve a problem. We're looking to solve here. We're not looking to talk or rearrange uh, anything that's, that's in the equation. We have everything that's in the equation. We just have to solve now. We have to solve for X. We have to solve for Y. We have to solve for Z. And that's what we're here to do. And that's what your voices mean. Each of your voices that come together, that's what that means. So great to hear the heartfelt testimony that come out. How that moved me, how that's recharged me and the fight that we have. So thank you. I appreciate everyone being here today. I know we're done a little bit early, uh, but that just means that uh, we can probably have a roundtable discussion this afternoon with uh, Congressman Simpson. So let's see out. Yeah, thank you. So you've just heard from all the tribal leaders that are here today representing their nations. And again, that's, that's the voice of thousands, not just their own. They speak on behalf of their people. The idea of a summit uh, has been out there for a while. Uh, Vice Chair Wheeler has been pushing for a Salmon and Orca Summit for some time and saying, we need to do this. We need to get our leaders together. We need to get our nations together because this doesn't just affect one of us, it affects all of us in more ways than one. And the timing is now. And so though there was a short turnaround time, that's why this had to be done. And this isn't the last one, this will continue. But the entire vision for this whole time was we said, what's the mission? What's the vision? Why are we doing this? And it's simple. It's salmon and orca recovery and making that a priority with the current administration and congressional leaders. So I wanna thank all of them that are on Zoom, that are here today, the staff that are taking this information back to, to their leaders, because this is important. It is important to a lot of people, not just one group. We are a little bit ahead of schedule, um, and so lunch isn't quite ready yet. But I, so I, I'm Nez Perce in Spokane, and I grew up in, in Nez Perce territory. And I didn't know anything besides salmon and trout and fish sticks. We did eat fish sticks. Uh, so growing up, that's all I ever cooked, right? And that's all I really enjoyed. Well, as I got older and I moved to Portland for a while and somebody gave me a rockfish and I didn't know what that was, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna throw it in the pan. No idea that fish, other fish have scales and that thing just fluffed up like a bird. And scales do not taste nor feel good when you're consuming them. Um, but that just shows my history with the salmon as a kid. And I'm, I'm 31, but I do recall going to uh, my favorite location, which is on the South Fork Salmon River. And we'd go there uh, as kids and would spend a week or more. Um, and we'd just go fishing the whole time and we'd be getting tons of fish. And I remember the, the first time I actually landed my own salmon and I'll tell you, I wish my dad were here, but he's my biggest cheerleader. And so, although this might not be true, he will tell you to this day, that is the biggest salmon he's ever seen. But I cast in my pole and there was a fence on the other side of the river. And so I, I threw it in trying to avoid that fence because a lot of people lost their hooks. And so I threw it over there and I pulled it back and it caught. And I was like, oh, I got one, I got one. And so I'm, I'm pulling it and pulling it, pulling it. And there's nothing. So I'm like, dad, I snagged my hook. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, just go ahead and walk back and break your line. So I did. And I, you know, I was just a little girl back then. I, I don't know. I was probably like 13 or 14. And so I just started walking back. And next thing I know, it just jerks me forward. 
And this giant salmon just jumps out of the river, snaps the line and just takes off down river. My dad's like, oh my gosh. And he tells everybody the biggest salmon he's seen. I don't think it was, but I like his story better. But those are things that that's the last time I'd ever done that. And hopefully I'll get that chance again. But with that, I would like to continue on. We have some great things to come forward this afternoon and tomorrow. And we're gonna do this together and continue moving forward. So before we do break, I believe they're in the process of putting food out, but I know we're a little early. Um, but I would like to welcome up once again, Lee Wan Tyler, and he's gonna provide us with a blessing before we go to break. And from there, we will um, adjourn until 1.30. I would just like to note that we also have several friends here that came out to support our tribes and tribal leaders. Um, and they, when they found out about this, they said, we just wanna be there to support you. You guys are taking the lead, you guys are taking the charge, and we just wanna show you that we're there and we're here for you. And so I thank you all for coming and joining us. Uh, we also have the, the Red Road to DC, the totem pole journey. Folks are here because they also wanted to show their support for what we're doing over the next couple of days. Um, so I thank you all for being here and showing your support and coming together with us. Again, just thank you to the Zoom congressional delegates and participants. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to be taking our break, so we will put that on hold. It will be muted, but we will be back at 1.30 and we'll make sure to take the mute off and our internet is running great now. Uh, so thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Lee Wan. Uh, thank you again, Kilani and everyone else. Um, got a glass of water here. Uh, and I, I went to DC. Oh, I went to DC a while back. <laughs> I can see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I shared with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. I'm part of the Region 10 uh, R Talk, they call it as well, Region 10 Operations Committee. And when they come over here to Seattle, uh, and, uh, and I'm part of the National Tribal Caucus as well. And uh, we went to DC and uh, uh, met with uh, the Andrew Wheeler a while back when the Trump administration. And they're supposed to do that uh, consultation policy every year. They initiate that. And then I, I brought, brought forth about the water of life. And then a long time ago, and I was uh, uh, helping to teach at Shombanic High School, junior, senior high school. We put two cups of water side by side. And we did a, we did a little, uh, little uh, experiment. And uh, we left one sitting there by itself idle on this table like this. And this other table... We talked over it and prayed over it and then under microscopes. And as we looked at that one without talking about it and just letting it sit idle, you looked at it through the microscope and it looks plain. And then the one we prayed over, talked over like this, and, and we looked at it after we got through praying and talking to it and, and looked in the microscope and holy, it was really awesome. All the kids got to look at it and it was, uh, it was little tiny, little tiny, little uh, snowflakes and excitement and just uh, go, jumping around like that. It's, it's hard to explain, but that's, that's the spirit of life as native people and a lot of people know about how water is and many uh, others as well. Um, when, you, uh, when you go to the church and they say, hey, have some water and bread, I guess, but you know, and then uh, instead of wine, <clears throat> but, uh, but you know, uh, the Catholics and all that, they uh, drink wine and share bread, but that's how powerful the spirit of water is. I wanted to share that with others. That's how the river systems are, the waters, the springs, even the geothermal. So that's why we need to protect the, protect the water as well. And the, the species inside of it, the biota, the salmon need water and the climate change is changing. So we got to find a way to offset it and bring it back natural as possible. That's a tough one. So with that, I'm gonna <clears throat> share a song. So bear with me, everybody. And the Indian people, we have patience. And that's, that's the tough part, sacrifice. To have patience. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Don't be doing I 
Each every one of us in here who we represent and bless us. Bless us, Senator Mike Simpson here. We get health and happiness for being an advocate for here, for our people, for our species, for our environment, for our drumless fish and the orca as well. All these things that are dear to us with life. Holy Creator God, you bless us here this, this, this day. Each and every one of us are in our hearts, you know, our thoughts and minds, our wants and needs. You bless our people at home. Bless our families and mornings. So much to pray about. Can't cover it all. But you know, you, you know our hearts and thoughts and minds. You take care of it for us that way. In this water of life, you bless it for us. Spirit of it. All the species out there, environment. Natural resources, our relatives out there that was mentioned, they can't speak for themselves. Holy Creator God, you bless us with the humble hearts and forgive us too. We're not perfect people. And you bless us with a good, humble hearts, good health and happiness as we continue on this fight. Lead us into the victory to bring us back to salmon and bring balance and life in our Holy Earth Mother. Thank you, all my relations. Amen. All right. Thank you.
Okay, we're ready to get started here. Uh, if we can get Ron Allen to take his seat. Ron Allen, if you could take your seat, please. We can get uh, everybody moving if Ron Allen takes his seat. <laughs> and uh, uh, Craig Bill, Craig Bill, uh, we have a seat up here for you as well. Governor, Governor Inslee's uh, uh, tribal liaison will be uh, joining us up front as well. Okay, well, Tatsalach, uh, good afternoon. I hope everybody enjoyed their food and uh, well rested and uh, ready to continue the afternoon agenda. So we, once we get this going, we're gonna uh, probably switch up the agenda a little bit uh, here now. Uh, so we need a motion to amend the agenda. Ron Allen, can you make that motion, please? <laughs> So we have a motion by Mr. Allen to amend the agenda. So we're going to uh, place uh, Congressman Simpson now, and he'll be able to give his remarks. And uh, after that, we'll probably do some discussion uh, right after that. So with, it's my great honor and great pleasure to introduce a, uh, uh, our congressman from Idaho, uh, Congressman Mike Simpson. Thank you for that introduction. It's good to be with you today. Uh, before I start on the Columbia Basin Initiative and what we're doing, how we got there, what we're trying to accomplish, uh, I have to make a few remarks on what's gone on. I, this is the perfect example of why I never write a speech. Because by the time I got done listening to all the stories this morning and, and the people with their testimony, and then when I listened to the, to the uh, people presenting the totem pole and stuff, I would have had to rip up my speech and throw it away and start over because you've got my mind going in different directions and stuff. It's been very interesting to me, but I did notice, and maybe you noticed me smile a little bit when one of the presenters said, you know, they're, they're trying to straighten out the, or they're trying to restore the estuaries and, and uh, rivers and stuff here in the Puget Sound and other areas uh, because the Army Corps of Engineers at one time thought that, you know, just make those rivers straight. And that was the right thing to do. And it brought back, the fact that since I was chairman of the Energy and Water Appropriations Committee in the House, I've been working with the San Antonio River Restoration Project. Uh, and what they've done is the San Antonio River that goes through San Antonio used to flood all the time. So they brought in the Army Corps of Engineers and they just made a straight river that goes through there, gets the water through quicker and stuff. That was, you know, like 40 or 50 years ago. Thought they were doing the right thing at the time. Now we're spending money they're spending money, we're reimbursing them from Congress uh, to restore the river as it was once, once was. Which just goes to show you can change things. Even though when you did something, you thought it was the right thing to do, we've learned better now. And so they brought me down there and it was kind of interesting where they've restored the river, it's beautiful, it's a meandering sort of river. Uh, the, the willows and stuff are growing, the wildlife is coming back, the birds, it's on a flyway for a lot of uh, migratory birds. They're all coming back and stuff. And then you get to the part that they haven't done yet. And it's just a straight river with rocks piled on the side and everything. And you kind of go, who thought that was a good idea? But we are restoring it. We're doing those kind of things all across this country. Fact is, we need to do them in the greatest environmental restoration project that this country has ever seen. And that's with the Columbia Basin. But I am proud to be here with you today. I was very moved by uh, listening to your stories today about, uh, about uh, your history with the salmon and what it means to you. And I am amazed by your commitment and your dedication to this issue. Believe it or not, you all inspire me to do what I'm doing. We've been working on this for three or four years. Last February, I introduced the Columbia Basin Initiative as an idea and, and uh, 
we kind of got the reaction we thought we would would get. And I've got to tell you in all honesty that sometimes me and my chief of staff, we feel like we're manic depressives. One day we come into the office and it's, all right, we're going to get going on this. The next day it's, oh, what have we done? Why are we doing this? You know, and hopefully we're on different days when we do this so that we can inspire each other. But whenever we have a down day, I think of what this means to you all and what you've been through for the last 40 or 50 years trying to restore salmon and the importance that they have. I have to tell you in all honesty, though, and I don't mean to put additional pressure on you. Maybe you already know this. The key to this whole thing is you all. The reason I say that, let me give a, just a little brief history of myself first. I grew up in Blackfoot, Idaho. The southern border of our town is the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. So I went to school with a lot of uh, Chauvin Indians, uh, had a lot of friends, came to school. We played football and basketball together and all that, kind of, all that kind of thing. And I worked in the summer out on the reservation, moving pipe and so forth. But I can't tell you in all honesty that I really knew these fellow classmates. Nathan Small, that I think you all know, has been around a lot of years. He was a classmate of mine. I can't say I really knew them, didn't know their history. When I became chairman of the Interior Subcommittee, we fund the BIA, the Indian Health Services, all of that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, I need to know more. So I started studying, this has been about 10 years ago, Native American history in this country, the culture, the religion to some degree, I would love to know what the honor songs, how they came about, what they mean. But it's a rich, rich history in this country. But I thought I needed to know more. What I've come to the conclusion is with the Columbia Basin Initiative and why I say this is that you are the key to this. You and I have the same goals. We have very different motives. My goal is I'm a congressman from Southeast Idaho. I'm trying to restore a fish from going extinct, an important fish, an iconic fish of the Pacific Northwest. I'm trying to do it because it's the right thing to do. I don't think we should ever let a species go extinct if we can prevent it especially when it's going extinct because of actions we've taken. The Endangered Species Act requires me, I, I believe, to try to find a solution to this problem, to try to make sure that we can actually recover these salmon. But what I've learned and come to understand is it's more than that for you. For the same reasons I do, we shouldn't let them go extinct, but you're trying to preserve a history, a culture, and a religion. Those are powerful motivating factors.
one of my good friends said, you got to remember this. He said, everything we do on the Columbia River can be done differently. It's a choice we, it's a choice we make, but it can be done differently. Salmon don't have a choice. They need a river. And guess what? Right now, they don't have a river. It's almost a misnomer to call the Lower Snake River a river. The Lower Snake River is a series of slackwater pools that endanger and kill salmon. Now, when we first started this project, we really had four, four goals in mind. In fact, four goals came to us kind of after we started. The first one was try to save the BPA, make them competitive in the future, because power is important in the Pacific Northwest. Most of our power is hydropower. And they are facing some financially challenging times. They've about reached their borrowing limit uh, from the federal treasury, and they're gonna be asking to increase that borrowing authority. Uh, so they're facing some financial, uh, some financial challenges. I used to say they were going broke. That's probably an overstatement, but it is going to be financially challenging for them. So we said, okay, how do you, how do you address that, make them competitive into the future, and we looked at what we started digging into the BPA and looked at what the, what the challenges were there, and mostly it's all the ancillary costs that we put on the BPA. Every time somebody has a good idea, we say, I'll let the BPA pay for it. Well, those add up. And so ratepayers pay for those things, whether it's the $17 billion we've spent on fish mitigation costs so far. The one thing we've not done is mitigate the costs and mitigate the, the uh, dams and restored salmon runs. Uh, it is the endless litigation that goes on and the amount of money that they have to spend on what I call the salmon wars. And we said, okay, how do, you, how do you control those costs? How do you get rid of this salmon wars? How do you have a pause in these while we try to recover salmon? And as we talked to people, the one answer was, you got to do what's necessary to save the salmon. So that led us into, okay, what's it going to take to save these salmon? And we started from the position of, you know, there's got to be a way to save these dams and also save salmon. There's got to be a way. And we dug deep and we looked at what had been done over the last 25, 30, 40 years. Then we looked at the science. We came to the conclusion, and I firmly believe this, you are not gonna restore the Lower Snake River salmon runs, the endangered salmon runs that come to my district to spawn. You're not gonna restore them with the dams in place. That's what every fish biologist that I know of has said. To me, the science is clear. You've got to remove the dams, which brought us to the point, to the most controversial issue, and the thing that takes up most of the pressure on, on uh, the Columbia Basin Initiative is, okay, if you're going to remove those dams, we all have to admit those dams have a value. They're used for transportation because of barging. They produce electricity other benefits. How are you going to make the stakeholders, those who benefit from the dams in the current situation that they're in, how are you going to make them whole again, or to the extent that you can make them whole again? Which meant you're going to have to replace the power. Those potentially produce 3,000 megawatts of power. Usually it's about eight or 900 megawatts that they produce at any given time, but they're a reserve power. And when you have necessary uh, when you need firm power, when the demand is there, they produce that. So you're gonna to have to replace that power. How are you gonna replace it? Well, it's interesting to note that when those dams were put in place, it was 1950, 1940, 1945 is when they were authorized by the uh, Congress. They kept asking for funding. Uh, the Army Corps kept asking for funding for these dams every year in the appropriation bill. Congress refused to fund them. 1953, eight years later, the chairman of the appropriations committee was a guy named Cannon from Missouri. 
was asked, why won't you fulfill the request of the Army Corps of Engineers to start building Ice Harbor? His response was amazing. He said, because the building of this dam will mean the eventual extinction of a species. And that's something we cannot contemplate because once a species is gone, it's gone forever and only God can replace it. Then two years later, two senators slipped in a, an appropriation rider for a million dollars to start Ice Harbor and that started the domino that got all, the four, all four of the dams built. But we've known what was gonna happen or had a very good indication all the way since 1953 of what was gonna happen if you built these dams. And as I said, we've spent $17 billion trying to get around that. And all you see is the salmon starting to decline. I actually had a member of Congress on the floor the other day say, she was talking about, we were, we were talking about a bill that dealt with the culverts and replacing the culverts, Derek Kilmer's bill in the house, which we passed, which I helped uh, sponsor. Uh, she said, you know, we've got we've to replace these culverts and stuff, but the Snake River salmon are doing fine. I said to her, really? So what are you looking at? And she shows me last year's numbers. Last year's numbers are a tick up. But you know, it's kind of like the stock market tape. The overall is down, is a down inclination uh, to the salmon. They are going extinct, but you'll see upticks and downticks as it goes along on this path down toward extinction. Make no mistake about it. If those dams remain, the lower Snake River dams, salmon will go extinct. At least the four dam, four uh, runs that come into Idaho. Now, when I first presented this, people said, and some of your tribal members said, well, this sounds like it's all about Idaho. And I guess that's where I put my emphasis because that's where the greatest challenge is. Uh, but you know, we do more than that. We put money into watershed improvements in, uh, in uh, whether it's the Willamette Basin, the Puget Sound, the John Day drainage, the Yakima River. We put money in there to improve water quality. So it's about saving salmon altogether. And what's happened over the years, as I've read the history of these salmon, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting when you read what happened to salmon in England and Ireland 200 years ago, 250 years ago, what happened to the Atlantic salmon on the East Coast 100 years ago, and what's happening now. The debate is exactly the same. Some factors may change, but the debate is exactly the same. And that is there is always enough things that affect salmon runs that you can point to something else as being the cause. So when we started, when we released this plan, we knew that the dam removal would be very controversial and it has proven to be that. But the, some of those people that, that don't accept that say, well, it's not the dams, it's the ocean conditions. Ocean conditions are bad all over. That's true. They do affect salmon runs. The difference is, is that you look at the salmon river, the, the, the uh, salmon returns on the Fraser River that has no dams. They're down from what they normally are, but they're still at a sustainable level. The problem with the four, the, the four runs on the lower Snake River is when they go down, they go to extinction. That's the challenge with them. Others will say, well, it's the predators. We need to do more predator control. True, we're doing more predator control. But fish biologists will tell you to a person that I've talked to anyway, there's, I got a letter from 68 of them or something like that. That if you did all of those things, if ocean conditions improved, if we control the predators better, if we did better on harvest, those four runs are still gonna go extinct. And so what have we done over the last 25 years? Collaborative, after collaborative, after collaborative. 
And I don't mean to criticize those. They have recommended some good things that needed to be done. But they refused to address the big elephant sitting in the corner of the room. And they tell me because they couldn't get consensus on that. If you're waiting for consensus on removing the dams, salmon are gone. The reality is it's just got to get done if you're going to save these salmon. But the collaboratives over the years have been a way of, well, I, I hate to attribute motives to people, but what they've done is delay what needs to be done and say, well, we've addressed the issue. We've decided that you need to improve habitat. Hey, everybody can agree with that. We can all come to an agreement on that. We can put some money in to improve habitat. Well, we need to get rid of the culverts that are old and, and uh, undersized and so forth. Hey, we all agree with that. We can get that done. We need to control predators better. Okay, we'll all agree with that. But then all the collaborators break down when it comes to what are you gonna do about the dams on the Lower Snake River? Because they can't come to consensus. If that's what we're waiting for, we're never going to get there. That's why this is important. That's why this debate needs to happen now. That's why we introduced it last February to start this debate. And I will tell you in all honesty, I don't care whether they call it the Simpson Columbia Basin Initiative or some other title. I don't care if they take my name completely out of it. I just want it done. And I will continue to work with you hard to make sure that we can get it done. But it is a challenge. what I believe or detracts from what I believe. And if we're just waiting for science that will agree with what you say that we don't need to remove the dams, I don't know if that science is going to come. The science is done on this. If you look at the efforts that have been put into this by fish biologists and all the studies that have been done, the science is done. Now we need to act. So I'm tired of those people that say, uh, we just need better science. And I'm tired of people to say there are other things that we need to, need to do, like, like uh, predator control, like uh, removing uh, uh, or improving habitat, so forth and so on. If all those things are true. They're not going to recover salmon, as I said. I'm tired of people who have said, you know, I want salmon back as much as you do, but aren't willing to take the steps necessary to do it. What they kind of mean is, I want the salmon back as much as you do. It's as important to me as it is to you. So I want to do everything we can to restore salmon as long as I don't have to change anything I'm doing. That's not going to happen. We're going to have to change what we're doing. And as I said, everything we do on the Columbia River, we can do differently, but we are human beings. Somebody mentioned it earlier today in the talk that we don't like change. I kind of like the sun to come up tomorrow approximately where it did today. So as human beings, we're kind of resistant to change. I had one individual say to me, why do you want to upset a system that's working? He happened to be a grain producer in Idaho. And he said, why do you want to upset a system that's working? I said, it might be working for you, but it's certainly not working for salmon. And it's certainly not working for the Pacific Northwest. Now, my question to you is, can we find a way that you can get grain to Portland as cheaply as you can now? And yes, we can. So why would you oppose that? Because it involves change. Change means uncertainty. When 
Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. He said in there that men are more predisposed to suffer evils while sufferable than to right themselves and correct them. That's the way we are. As long as things don't hurt too much, we can suffer through some of those evils. But unfortunately, we can't go on much longer. These salmon need to be recovered now. As I've read the Nez Perce study and some of the other things, we don't have that many years left. And I'm certain that there are members or individuals, not members, but individuals out there who will tell you, I'd like to see salmon recovered also. When what they really mean is, I hope these damn things go extinct fast so that we can get this debate over with and get on with our business. And that's sad. But I do believe a majority of the people in the Pacific Northwest want to see salmon maintained. But as I said, one of the biggest challenges in our bill and why it costs $33.5 billion, not an insignificant amount of money, is you're going to have to replace the power. You're going to have to replace the transportation system that gets grain down the river. We can do those things. We're going to have to address the recreational uh, opportunities that people have the, the, uh, along the, the lower Snake River. There's a lot of things that you're going to have to address. Each of those costs a little money. And also putting money into cleaning up the water quality and, and so forth is very important. But as I've, the last, what is it now, five months, six months, since we introduced the Columbia Basin Initiative. As I said, the response we've got is about what I expected. We knew that there would be some people that would say, hell no, never, never gonna, re never gonna remove those dams. Why do I know that? 25 years ago, that's where I was. When I was Speaker of the House in Idaho, as was <laughs> mentioned by Vice Chairman Wheeler, they started looking at removing dams in the late 1990s. I was Speaker of the House in Idaho, and I can remember when the first person that said that to me, I started to laugh. I said, we're not gonna take those dams out. You gotta be crazy. I said, we need to, we need to do everything that we can to recover, recover salmon before you take that last major irretrievable step. That's where I was 25 years ago. And over the last 25 years, we've done everything you can do. I had a doctor, not a doctor, excuse me. I used to be a dentist, so I was kind of a doctor, semi-doctor, <laughs> but I, uh, they brought the head of the National Farm Bureau out to tour the dams. Afterwards, he said, well, it seems like Dr. Simpson wants to prescribe a heart transplant for a patient that just needs some more medication. I read that. I said, really? I said, give me the medication. Tell me what it is that we haven't tried. Every person that I've talked to, every group that I've talked to, whether they're pro-dam removal or anti-dam removal, I said, if you got a better idea, let me know. If you got a magic wand to restore salmon, I'd like to know about it. If you've got a way to keep the dams in place and still restore salmon, fine, let me hear it. But it's gotta be something that's real, that will restore salmon, and not just more of the stuff that we've tried in the past. And I'm not critical of the stuff we've tried in the past, it just hasn't worked. And so you have more and more collaboratives. We now have the four governors collaborative. I don't know how long that will go on or what their recommendation will be. Will they have the nerve to say, you know what? We need to follow the science and we've got to take these dams out. I don't know. State of Idaho, Governor Little put together a salmon working group that met for like 18 months. Talked about a whole bunch of different ideas. And they came up with some good ideas, things that need to be done. 
but they wouldn't address that elephant in the corner of the room. Because they said, well, we can't reach consensus on that. Eventually, you just got to do it. That's where we are now. You know, I had an uncle. I still have an uncle. I shouldn't say had. Makes him sound like he's gone. His family and my family, or my father's family, our two families are very close. We spent our summers up at Redfish Lake, a place I love dearly. And I've always thought, you know, I'd love to see why they call Redfish Lake Redfish Lake. I can remember the year that they brought back one sockeye salmon come, came back. They call it Lonesome Larry, if you remember. But my Uncle Farrell's family and my dad, they were very, very close. We went on vacations together. We did everything together. And my Uncle Farrell's wife has since died. He was an engineer out to the Idaho National Laboratory, Farrell was. And my dad has died. So my mom and Farrell get together periodically, uh, about every Monday, and go to lunch at some restaurant around, around town and just shoot the bull about what's going on and that kind of stuff. They like, they like me to come occasionally because they like to know what's going on in Washington, D.C., and they like to complain about what's going on, and so I go listen to them and stuff. And uh, in November, they asked me, well, what's going to happen in Washington come the first of the year? I said, well... All crap's going to hit the fan. And Farrell looked at me and said, and you, my, my uncle and my, my uh, dad loved the outdoors. They loved to hunt. They, loved, they didn't fish so much, but they loved to hunt. They loved to ride horses into the wilderness. They just loved to spend time outdoors. I always said my dad was born about 100 years too late because he loved outdoors. So I said, well, all crap's going to hit the fan come January. Farrell said, well, why is that? I said, well, I'm going to introduce a plan to restore Idaho salmon runs, and it's going to involve removal of the four lower Snake River dams. And he looked at me and says, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I said, really? Stupidest thing you've ever heard? And so we talked about it for a little bit. He says, well, we need the power. I said, we can replace the power. When those dams were built, the option was hydropower or coal. And they built them for national defense reasons because of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. There are a gazillion ways to replace that power now, different ways to produce power. We can do that. And then I just kind of let it die. And we had lunch and he and mom started talking. And the four of them, my mom and dad and Uncle Farrell and Aunt Catherine used to go on horseback rides up into the wilderness, and they'd go for three or four days. One time I had to call the Forest Service and have them located because we thought that they'd got lost somewhere, but, but uh, they, they just loved doing that. And Farrell said to mom, remember that time we were up on that ridge, and I can't remember what area they were in, but we were up on that ridge and we looked down on this creek that we saw down there, and there were these big black rocks in this creek. And then as we sat and looked at them, we said, man, those rocks are moving. And we realized they were salmon. So we went down by the water and sat and he says, we spent all afternoon just watching these salmon, kind of playing with them and a few things. He said, it was just amazing. And mom said, yeah, those were, that was special and stuff. And lunch went on when it was done and I paid the bill as is usually the case when I go. I don't know why, but anyway, when I, uh, when I, uh, when it was done and we were walking out, I said to Farrell, I said, those sound like some really great times that you and dad and mom and Aunt Catherine had up in the wilderness. He said, yeah, they were, they're great memories. And I said to him, would you like your grandchildren and your great grandchildren to be able to create, to create those same kind of memories. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, you know, I would. He's now one of the strongest supporters of this. The challenge is 
I can't talk to millions of people one-on-one. -on -one. So it takes all of us to do this. It's gonna take all of us to get this job done and it's gonna be continual. And as I said, your story, I think is the iconic story that has to be told. That people have to understand that for you, this is not just saving an endangered species. This is saving a way of life, an important way of life, one that we cannot let disappear. That's why I've been so supportive of things like the show bands are now have a, a Bannock only education area where all the students have to speak Bannock all the time. It's important that we preserve these languages. We can't let them die. But that's an important story that you have to tell. And only you can tell it. So I appreciate the dedication and the, and the effort that you all put into this. I know it's hard work. As I said, I've been working on this for like four years in serious effort. You've been working on this for 40 or 50 years or even longer. But I'm with you. <laughs> I questioned whether I should tell you this or not in conclusion, because I thought you'd probably think I was making this up, but I'm not. It's a true story. And if anybody, anybody understands it, you probably will. As I said, we go through manic depressive times in our office about, you know, why are we doing this? And okay, we got to do this and things are looking up and et cetera, et cetera. And I should say, we are making headway. We are making headway with people. I talked to the grain growers in McCall not too long ago, a group that is not supportive of what we're trying to do, but they were respectful and we had a good conversation. And afterwards, a couple of guys came up to me and said, you know, I came up here as a hell no, we're never gonna take the dams out, but you've given me something to think about and we need to discuss this. That's the best I can hope for, is to get people talking about this. If we've done nothing else, if this initiative never, never gets enacted and if something else gets done, the one thing we have started is the conversation in a serious manner that is occurring in the Pacific Northwest. But what I was going to say is one of those down days that I was having, I went to bed that night and I had a dream. And I woke up and I was just exhausted. The dream was I was on a mountainside and I was traveling down a path, down this mountain, dangerous path. And it was completely dark. I couldn't see the path. So I just had to kind of feel my way along it. And it was very stressful. But in the end, I got down the mountain and came into this beautiful meadow. And I woke up, like I said, I was exhausted. And it kind of hit me. That's where we are. We're on a path. We might not be able to see the path forward, but we are on a path. And if we keep moving, we will come to that meadow. We will not let these fish go extinct. And to par paraphrase what Winston Churchill said, we will never Never, never give up. Thank you all.
<sighs> All right. Didn't even blink an eye after lunch. Usually you kind of get to that after lunch presentation. You're like, oh, but not, not today. <laughs> So we'd like to take this opportunity to really open it up. Uh, you know, the whole point of this summit is to take action and to find a solution. So we wanna take this opportunity to really have this open dialogue and conversation. And fortunately, we have time to do that. Um, so we have some microphones up here. We just wanna open it up. Um, so, you know, we have our tribal leaders forward. If you had something you wanted to say earlier, you didn't get your chance, you have questions, um, you know, let's open up the conversation and let's discuss this. Let's, let's make plans. Uh, that's what we're here to do today. So. Can I say one more thing before you? Yes, please. Let me, let me say one, let me say one more thing. I didn't, I didn't address this, but I should. When we started this four years ago, we didn't know who would be president, who would control the House, who would control the Senate. We didn't know any of that kind of stuff. When they started talking uh, last year about an infrastructure package, about a uh, jobs package or whatever, and it was in the trillions of dollars, we looked at it and said, hey, you know, this might be an, an opportunity to get the $33.5 billion put aside in a piece of uh, legislation and put aside so that it couldn't be used until we came up with the plan, whatever that is. Because frankly, if we started writing this, this bill, my plan today, it'd probably take us a year to write the bill. So it's gonna take a while to get that done, but we would have the money set aside. And that was what we were talking about at the time. I found that some, <laughs> where I thought there would be some excitement from some people about it, there was, uh, there was not. And the reason was, uh, I found out in talking to some other people is that, they felt like if they supported putting the $33.5 billion in a Columbia Basin initiative, that it would mean that they, in, that they supported everything in my bill. And I kept telling them, that's not the issue. I just want the money set aside so that we can, it will be there once we come up with a plan. Well, as you know, we're still hashing things out in, in Washington. So... I don't know whether uh, we will be able to get any money in uh, for a Columbia Basin Initiative or restoration project or whatever you want to call it uh, in this infrastructure bill or in any of the other bills that are coming along. But that doesn't mean this dies. Some people think if, ah, if we stop them from getting the money in the infrastructure bill, then this is dead. That's not true. There are a variety of different ways to get this done. The easiest way or the, or the most uh, efficient way is to have the money there before you start doing it. But uh, if we don't, we don't. As I said, we don't give up on this. You don't give up on this. We will get it done one way or another. But it is not, we didn't put this together based on the Biden uh, infrastructure bill or anything else. We, didn't, we had no idea who was going to be president or anything else when we started this. We just looked at that as an opportunity. So if people say, well, they didn't get the money in the infrastructure bill, so I guess they're dead. That's not the case. Okay, uh, so just to clarify, um, you know, any questions or comments directed toward Simpson is acceptable. That's kind of what we're here to do and work on this together. So. Is there anybody that like would that would like to come forward first? Not any comments. <laughs> <laughs> Tread lightly. <laughs> Testing. How do you turn this on? Is it on? Yeah. I just want to real quickly mention. I know it was probably been talked about before. Was uh, <clears throat> you mentioned Nathan? Nathan Small. And uh, as, as you're aware, uh, unlike Simpson, that Department of Energy is right located next to us. INL, right? It's our neighbor up there, and also there are so much projects going on over there, scientific technology, and uh, there's the reactors, they're uh, building small reactor projects that could offset the hydro and could still um, provide all this, uh, to generate the utilities, electricity, et cetera, which uh, hydropower is doing, and uh, I'm sure you guys all thought of that, but that might be a way to work with them and to get them involved in find a way to offset so we won't lose the what, what's happening with the hydropower and still take out those four dams and the lower snake and uh, fulfill them with the hydro 
I, uh, that, that, that might, that's one concept of a solution that I'm just throwing out there. I would like uh, Dan, Danny to come talk. Dan Stone, uh, he's, one, he's one of our uh, champion uh, leaders from, he, he traveled long ways, him and Chad Coulter. So I, I didn't want to put him on the spot, but he better come up here and say a few words. Thank you. No, this is a, this is a really good, great summit. I appreciate everybody for having us. I think uh, kind of in our way, it's always customary to, you know, tread lightly when you're in somebody else's territory. We acknowledge the Squaxin, all the people out here on the Puget, everybody up and down the river whose country we traveled through to get here. It's about 12 hours from the headwaters of the snake over where we're at. Um, that's our country. It's a long ways. And we notice change. And another thing that you notice when you see change on a scale like we're seeing this year, with oppressive heat, low water, drought conditions, is you notice that everybody along the river is in dire need of help. Whether it's tribal communities that we've passed, the rural communities that have been overlooked by economic development, um, they're like the freeway version of a flyover state in some of these places like Grand Ron, the Upper Powder, Baker, Ontario. And what we came to in that 12 hour drive was that this debate is really a system of, it's a debate about value systems. What do we as a region value? I know as tribal communities, um, our value systems are, tend to be a little different, but we can all agree on some common threads. We all need clean water. We all need cold water. We can't live outside of the, the natural environment. We live within it. If anything, this year is a demonstration of that. Mother nature is a part of our existence. We can't just air condition our way out of a heat dome the same way we can't farm our way out of a food crisis. And so what we're talking about is change. Change at a fundamental level, at a systemic level, addressing things that haven't been addressed for decades. And of course, you're gonna come up with some forms of resistance to that. And I can't put it any better than what Congressman Simpson had said. It, typically, it's that idea of change that scares people more than the change itself. When we decide what kind of energy system is gonna replace the current hydropower system, people's lights will still turn on and off. People are still gonna have access to the grid and it's gonna be better than it was before and they won't notice that piece of change. When we figure out how to get a grain to market without putting it on a barge or a truck, um, people are gonna be okay with that change. The market is gonna behave the way it did before. And at the end of the day, when we finally figure out how to develop communities around river systems by restoring 140 miles worth of reservoir into a river, the recreational community is gonna be okay with that change too. It's gonna to become a part of people's way of life. From a tribal perspective, all of these things are consistent with our value system. The power of gathering everyone here today, whether it's online, digital, or you're in the room today, is that we have another value for these fish that's gonna be better than it is before. We talk a lot about in these plans, keeping people whole that are whole now. Very rarely do we talk about making tribal communities whole who have suffered for a century with no fish, who have suffered through seven generations of trauma and stolen land and missing and murdered and all of the issues that go along with our communities that you can tie back to the loss of our connection to the landscape, the cultural geography and the subsistence foods we need for our communities to thrive. So when we talk about what this means, it's not just about removing four dams, it's about restoring a river, a way of life, and reconnecting the ocean where we are now to the headwaters of the snake where I'm from. So with that, I'll, I'll let other leaders take a chance.
So Congressman <clears throat> Ron Allen, Jamestown again. Um, I want to talk a little strategy. So, uh, you know, we've heard that, you know, the criticism by the Washington delegation, your colleagues, Captain McMorris Rogers and Dan Newhouse, et cetera. Um, I'm, am I assuming correct that you're already engaging with them? You know, that these dams are in Washington. Um, and of course, you know, we've got the uh, governor's shop here represented in, in our, and a couple of our senators um, engaged. So uh, how do you see, um, getting the dialogue going in that congressional forum, both in your house and also with, with the senatorial uh, colleagues? Well, that's a good question. Uh, over the last three years, we've had probably now it's up to 500 meetings with different stakeholders, different groups, different individuals, uh, with members of Congress. I think we've briefed every member of Congress from the Pacific Northwest, almost every member anyway, about what we were doing I didn't expect uh, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers or Congressman Newhouse to come in and say, man, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. The dams are in their district. Uh, I was disappointed in some of their comments that they've made. Uh, one of the things they did is one of the environmental groups uh, foiled uh, uh, the, the uh, emails between our office and the governor of uh, Oregon. And of course, we'd talk to her fish people a lot of times. And when I told, I've told Kathy and Dan all along exactly what we were doing. And I said, if you're going to end the lawsuits here, you have to talk to the people that are filing the lawsuits and find out what's it going to take. Oregon's always involved in the lawsuits, it seemed like. So we talked to them extensively. We talked to some of the environmental groups that are always in the lawsuits. We talked to a lot of the tribes that sometimes file lawsuits and so forth. And so what's it going to take to, to end these lawsuits? So there was a lot of communication between us and them. And then so they foiled this request, which I thought was kind of funny. All they had to do is ask us and we would have given them the information. I mean, we're not trying to keep anything secret. But so Dan and Kathy put out a press release, said that, aha, Simpson says he's being transparent, transparent but what he's been doing is secretly collaborating with uh, the governor of, uh, of uh, Oregon to put this plan together. That's... The only time I've got really pissed off, to tell you the truth, uh, because they know it's not true. And I have been open with them. I have been, uh, I, as I said, we've briefed either the other members or their staffs. Uh, Earl Blumenauer has, uh, has signed on to this, not necessarily to the Columbia Basin Initiative, but to the need to address this issue. There are some things within what I propose that he disagrees with, but you know what? We can work those out as long as you agree. We got to solve this problem. And saving salmon is going to require removal of dams. He understands that. But it is uh, there. Understand also that politicians are naturally averse to risk. We can say the right things all the time. But when it comes time to make a decision, particularly a difficult decision, particularly one that carries political risks, we just as soon not have to do it. I don't say that of others, I say that of all of us, me included. But you know what? The time for talking is over. It's time for action now. So we'll continue to talk to these, uh, these members, but frankly, if I'm the only one talking to them, they're gonna wonder why they wanna step out off, off this cliff, you know? What they need to know is that there's support out there for that. They need you to talk to them, to let them know, wait a minute, what we're talking about here is solving a problem, and that's what members of Congress should do. I look at this as part of my job. I'm not a hero or anything else. I'm just doing my job. And my job is when I see a problem, I should try to solve it. And I should listen to people and see how we can do that. If you're not doing that, then why the hell were you elected? So, so <clears throat> I think the, the, the comment, um, the time for talking is over, time of getting, doing things, uh, it makes sense. 
the doing things is to, in my opinion, is to engage in the stakeholders who have an interest and have concerns, A, B, and C, whatever they are, whatever yep. interest group that they represent. So um, when I look at the one and a half billion dollar initiative by the four dams and, and, uh, and the estimates that come into it, um, I don't think any of, the, of your colleagues on both, on, in both houses would disagree that uh, there's no way in hell is the salmon could disappear on our watch. So, they, so that's an easy one. Yep. It's what do you do about it? So um, I, the first thing that comes to mind is um, <clears throat> how do we initiate the dialogue of the interest groups to talk about uh, the strategy of how to implement it to remove dam A, B, and C? And um, so um, who's, whose interest is, concer is, is concerned and how is it addressed? So what, the third, first thing that comes to my mind is that we need money to do that. And we need um, a lead entity, agency, et cetera, to do that. I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you because reclamation has a big dog in this fight. Yeah. Um, they're not the ones to take the lead because they have, the, they, they have all the, the biggest reasons why not as to, as opposed to how to. Yeah. So, um, now, do they have to be at the table? Absolutely. So, so I, I don't know. I have an answer here, but I and and um, and I also um, I think that the tribes would love to be able to take the lead. But we have a, a, a trust issue that's out there in the non-Indian sector. Yep. You know, and and in all candor, you, you can I can hear them saying, "What the hell are them Indians up to?" Yep. Okay. But we have to be at the table because we have rights. We have treaty rights. Yep. Okay, and, uh, and, but set aside the treaty right, we care about the damn resource. And that's what your point is, right? So now, how do we make that happen? And I, I don't have an answer, but I, I kind of want to put this on the table as, as a matter of strategy. Uh, and we may not, uh, uh, Shannon, we may not come out, of the an come out of this two days with the answer, but I think we have to get closer to the answer to uh, urging you and your colleagues to uh, appropriate money for us to get the job done. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of work. And I, I know you know that, um, to bring those parties together to engage in that, converse, that conversation in those kinds of forum. The, the three governors yep. have a big, you know, have a high interest in this thing. And so we need their, rep, their offices in the, in, the, in the conversation. You know, your colleagues, their offices gotta be in the conversation and all the other stakeholders. So. I just want to throw that out uh, that at least a meaningful first step, money to help us orchestrate the, the, the implementation of a plan. Because we, we have to have a plan, right? You, 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 I've been through it in my backyard with, with uh, the, the lower Elwha dams, the engineering and all the other interest groups, et cetera. How do you do that? Yeah. The, the sentiment, you know, uh, and so there's lots of issues that have to be work, engineered and worked out. Right. So. Um, but but you have to deal with the stakeholders, calm the dial down the, the anxiety, and uh, to me we we need to get there. I, so we need resources to do that. I would encourage that that be a part of the initial first steps. Uh, now maybe I'm out of uh, out of sync here with you know where you and your team um, and those that are on, on this bandwagon. Um, you know, and I don't I haven't been tracking as close as you have, Shannon. Yeah. But uh, those are things that come to my mind. Just, just my observation. And I appreciate that those comments. It is it is a good question. Where do we, it's essentially where do we go from here? How do we get people involved and stuff? Uh, uh, we can do more of this just talking to people and that kind of thing, but we actually need some action. And uh, maybe that's let me give some thought about uh, how we you know we me and my team have been so concentrated on trying to get these resources into this infrastructure bill that we haven't really thought about. Uh, where do we go if we if we don't do this? Although there are, as I said, other ways uh, to do it. But uh, planning a strategy is obviously something that needs to get done. What I don't want to occur is putting some money into something and say, okay, it turns into another collaborative. You know, if you get if you 
if, if we do another collaborative, it's going to be the same result that all the other 25 collaboratives in the past have, have come up with. If it is a strategy, if it is a, a group that is a strategy of how do we, for lack of a better term, how do we sell this and the need to remove the dams and how do we restore the salmon, uh, then, uh, then that's a different story. But that's something that, that we need to give some thought to. But what you said uh, is absolutely true. Uh, I believe that the tribes have to be central in the decision-making process of anything that we do. That's why we, it, part of our plan here is we've taken fish management away from the Bonneville Power Administration in our, in our proposal and put it into a fish and wildlife fund that would get $600 million a year from BPA, but it would be controlled equally by a representative from the four states and four uh, tribal members because you have to have an equal voice in, uh, in this. And, uh, and that to me is one of the critical points. But what you talk about is important. And I have to give that some more thought, but appreciate it. Congressman, Congressman Simpson. My name is Virgil Lewis Sr. I'm the vice chairman for the Yakima Nation Tribal Council. And I like the words that you spoke, very, very informative, and I appreciate the sincerity. I guess the thing that I'm looking at is your proposal to put management in back where it should belong, meaning the tribes themselves, all of us as salmon people have been managing the resource for decades, decades, and decades. If it wasn't for the tribes stepping up, as co-managers of the resource, we, the salmon would not be where they're at today. Yep. They would be gone. But now that we're, we're stepping up, we've stepped up and helped keep the salmon populations to a point to where hopefully they will not go extinct in my lifetime. I like your story about your father or your grandfather. My father and my uncle, yeah. I like that story. I have the similar situation up in our closed area. We have spring Chinook salmon that swim up the Klickitat River up to the headwaters. When I was a boy, my father took us up there, my, me and my brothers, to the headwaters of the Klickitat River and took us down near the edge of the water. And I could see those salmon swimming right there in the clear water. There were dozens of them in that shallow water just swimming. And I asked my dad, I said, how, dad, how come we don't catch them? They said, no, you leave them alone. They're gonna be spawning for future generations. I drive up there now and I don't see anything. But we have a hatchery down in the lower Klickitat River that is working to rebuild the resource. <clears throat> it's, it's taking time. Yep. We also are transporting sockeye from Priest Rapids Dam up to Lake Clayellum letting them go in Lake Cleellum so that they spawn naturally and it's working. We're reintroducing sockeye salmon in the Yakima River that have been extirpated from the Yakima River, but it's slowly working. We're rebuilding the resource. <clears throat> I guess knowing the, the situation and the long battle that you have, we all have to convince people that this is a good thing for the Northwest. And, and thinking about your story, I guess perhaps you need to talk to your constituents in that manner. Your doc, all of your constituents that you seek to support from, I guess you need to talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one level. Those that have the communities that they represent, if they can understand exactly where you're coming from and what their, their generations are going to lose should they not support this effort, maybe they will open their eyes and see exactly what you see, what I see, what we all see in this room. Because if we lose this resource 
and our future generations aren't able to see a small part of what I've seen growing up or a small part of what you've seen growing up, then we're not doing our job. As you stated, I was elected. If I'm, if I'm elected to represent people, I'm not doing my job if I don't speak up and say something. I guess the question I have for you, based on what you've seen so far, and knowing how Congress acts sometimes, <laughs> should it be approved that your, that your supporters agree that yes, this needs to move forward? Could you give a rough estimate of how long it would take for this to begin actually moving? Uh, would be a really rough estimate. Congress is the most unpredictable thing in the world. Uh, you know, I've been one of those that, that hopes that at some point in time we can get away from the partisanship and actually get back to doing the people's business. When I came 20 years ago or 23 years ago, parties worked across the aisle. I mean, Democrats had certain philosophies, Republicans had certain philosophies, that's okay. But we worked across the aisle to solve problems. And over the last 20 years, it's just gotten more and more partisan. So it, a prediction of how it would, it would happen, uh, uh, I think it has to be done within the next year, this year and next year, before the next election. I think something has to be done. Uh, I will tell you in all honesty, I'm contemplating whether I should say this or not, but I will. I think Republicans are going to take over the House next year, just given history, all that kind of stuff. I think this would be very hard to pass through a Republican House. So I think it needs to be done this year and next year. Uh, and, so, and so it's a lot of work to do uh, between now and then. But you know, we've been out speaking to our constituents. We've been, I've met with county commissioners all across Southern Idaho. And like I said, I've met with different groups. I've had, <laughs> it might not surprise you that I've had some of my best supporters over the years that have been lifelong supporters call me up and say, you're never going to get reelected if you pursue this. There's no way you can get reelected. And my answer to them is, you know what? So be it. My job is to try to solve a problem. And it's a small sacrifice if I lose my seat and we get this job done. That's fine. I'm fine with that. But it's going to be, it's going to be challenging for sure. And whether I win re-election or not, next May is our primary. If I win re-election or not, I'm either going to be working on this as a member of Congress or as a private citizen. Because I don't give up easy. So these conversations are ones that, that need to happen. You know, when you, you sit down in a room with 10, 12 people, you can have a reasonable conversation. And people will start to, they'll still bring up their objections and that kind of stuff. And you can sit and talk to them and say, well, Wait a minute, does that really make sense? I went up to a person's house that uh, is up in Rexburg. She's been a supporter of mine forever. She's worried about my reelection chances. And I said, bring some of your friends that are, that are talking to you about this uh, and complaining about this over to your house. So I went up and spent a couple hours with them one afternoon. I won't say that they all supported this afterwards, but they were all mellower <laughs> is I guess the best way to say it. They were all saying, well, maybe there is something to this. I'm not just out, you know, trying to remove dams because I think it'd be fun. I'm trying to do it because it's necessary. So what you say makes sense. And it is, it's, but it's not just me, it's others that need to be out making that. You would be surprised how many members of Congress have come up to me, some from this very state, and said, I kind of like what you're doing what you're proposing, but I can't publicly say that because my constituents aren't there yet. And I appreciate that, but your constituents are never going to get there <laughs> unless you talk to them about it, you know? But 
as I said, politicians are relatively risk averse. <laughs> well, Congressman, I appreciate your sincerity, your honesty. It's, it's Thank refreshing you. to know that there is someone there that will tell you straight out what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Appreciate um, that. I represent 11,000 enrolled Yakimas. And when I have, when we have a meeting, I know what you're talking about because the people that come to our general council meetings, the enrolled Yakimas that come to our meetings, a lot of them are against no matter what I say yep. when I get up in front of them. Yep. They'll oppose me no matter what. If it's for the betterment of the tribe, they'll oppose me. Why, I don't know, maybe they don't like the way that I look or the way that I talk, whatever the case may be. But uh, the reason I ask about a timeline, a possible timeline, I've been doing something on my own that's been going to benefit the Columbia River. And I've mentioned it to a, a few of the Columbia River tribes that we need to pursue dredging zone six from McNary Dam down to Bonneville. Yep. It has never been dredged before, ever. Never? Never. The sediment is building up in zone six at all the confluences. It's creating a hazard for our fishermen by changing the main stem course of the Columbia River. And if zone six was dredged, it would create a more free flowing Columbia River. And when the juvenile salmon come out into the, into the main stem Columbia River, they'll go out to the ocean healthier. Yeah, they'll get out there faster. Exactly. And when the adults come back, they'll be healthier. They'll be they'll come back to a cleaner river, a colder river, and they'll be able to go to their spawning grounds. So I've been pushing on that for the past couple of years. Well, I have a staff member that's working. That's his sole job is to work on that and get support for that. The reason I say this is because I know with this proposal, when it does become reality, then we can start looking at dredging, but I'm doing it now. Yeah. I'm trying to do something now on the main stem Columbia for the benefit of the salmon resource and all the, the, the resources up above it. So when yeah. you talk about doing something now, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I, uh, I did not know that, uh, that there'd been no dredging on the low, lower four Columbia River uh, dams. I, you know, part of the part of the cost of of um, removing the dams is you're gonna have to dredge behind them first, so you're not wash, washing a whole bunch of silt uh, down the river and stuff. So we put resources in there for that, but that that's something that we need to talk about uh, uh, in the future of uh, of what we might be able to do along those lines. Thank you for your time, sir. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Justin Parker. Is that on? Is it on? Move quick. Jeez, my lips are on it. Jeez. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, thank you, Congressman. Uh, you know, appreciate you taking time out of your uh, next couple of days for um, attending this, this summit and then talking about the importance and the um, how relevant the tribes are to the conversation. And, and so I, you know, I go back to two years ago, almost two years ago, Congressman Kilmer had out uh, your colleagues uh, at the time, Chairwoman Betty McCollum, uh, rank member David Joyce, bipartisan mm -hmm. party coming out to tour, uh, our Western Washington, we had them at Lower Elwha, out at Jamestown. And one of the things that, one of the stories that we're telling was that, you know, 170 years ago, when we signed those treaties, 1854 and 1855, it wasn't the tribes that created all these habitat problems that we're dealing with, but we're at the forefront of fixing them. Yep. You know, you heard Ron's example about, you know, they came in, tried to straighten out his, his watershed. Well, you can't, you have to have the meandering, the shade, so on and so forth. And so tribes, you including the tribes as part of this is really huge for us as, as executive director of Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and our 20 member tribes in Western Washington. Um, Wait, waiting for the four tribes in the Columbia River to really make this push. I've had many conversations with Vice Chairman um, Wheeler, uh, Chairman Forsman, Chairman Allen. Um, and so I'm glad we're getting to the strategic part of it because that's really where I want to jump in where we can go because right now it's really hard to wrap our head around the, the framework aspect, the outline, if you will, that you put together. I'm really looking forward to the pen to paper 
Um, in theory, I think our guys could quickly get behind us. There are some concerns. There's no, no question about it. 35 year moratorium on the litigation is gonna be sure. an issue for some folks. Um, the, the voluntary systems, we, we've tried that through Department of Ag and, and so on and so forth. Voluntary programs does not work for private landowners. Um, so there are, there are some concerns, but there is a lot of good. There's a lot to un, unbundle there. And I guess Mike and in, in where Virgil was going to this, you know, as we start putting pen to paper and start moving this, and I tried to impress upon your chief of staff when, when we met with them, uh, uh, I don't know, Leonard, two, two months ago, maybe it was, um, you know, we really need to see that text, you know, the, the right. conceptually is one thing, but when he's really talking about legislation, right. having that text, being able to, to give that a full analysis and, and get behind it or uh, call out certain areas where it can be a concern. Um, so my, my, and getting the Virgil's point again, where you're saying that it's got to happen this year or, or next year, but by the time our next election. So I, I'm, I'm understanding that. So that's, that's helpful. Um, but even if we were to get past, say, out of committee, ultimately out of the full house on the floor, and maybe this is a question for Sean, <laughs> but uh, what I'm concerned about is the bird rule. Um, what happens in terms of when it comes to budget reconciliation on the Senate side, when it comes to multiple jurisdictions how do we get over that that hump and trying to package this uh, yeah. uh, together are we better off and this is what i was throwing out the vice chairman wheeler a couple few weeks ago is is there bite-sized pieces that we should be focusing on instead of trying to put everything into one one package and, and try to advance and i know there's some individual bills like like you mentioned cantwell's bill that she's advancing a, relative to culverts so is there other ways we can go about doing this? So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that, thank you. Well, you know, it's, uh, if, you, if you break it up to individual parts, the problem is, is you'll pass the easy parts and not the hard parts. And it's the hard parts that you need to, that you need to pass. And sometimes you need those easy parts to drag the hard part across the finish line. Now, you're right, Sean could probably ask, answer better what happens in the Senate. I don't understand the rules of the Senate, never have, never wanted to be a Senator. Uh, and uh, the rules of the House are if you got 218 votes, you can do anything. Uh, so so I, I worry about trying to get it through the House uh, more than anything right now. And I'll worry about the Senate when, when uh, that occurs. Uh, but certainly an issue we need to be looking at in the future about how we're going to do that. But you're right. The reason we release this as a concept and not a piece of legislation is it's very complicated. And there are parts of it that as we, and I wanted the people of the Pacific Northwest to discuss it and say, yeah, you know, this is good. This doesn't make sense here. Okay, then what makes sense here? So that's the discussion we need to have before we start putting something down in, on legislative paper. If I, if I had drafted this legislation and introduced it, uh, it would mean that I've, I'm ready to go. This is what I've got and I'm ready to go with it, you know? I didn't want that. I wanted this concept out there so that we could have a full discussion on, on it. And as much as I hate to admit that we haven't done a perfect job because everything I do I thought was perfect, but uh, <laughs> there, we need input and we need suggestions and we need ideas. Uh, the 35 year moratorium on lawsuits is what, what we're trying to do is kind of end the salmon war for a while, kind of have a stalemate for, I mean, a, a, a pause for a while while we're recovering uh, the salmon and see how it goes. Maybe that's the wrong way to do it. I don't know. If there's a better way, fine. I'm open to ideas and suggestions and stuff. And that's why we've been talking to an awful lot of people, including uh, some of your people, about what the ideas are and, and what we might be able to do to, to make it, to address some of the concerns some people have. Green light, come on. Okay, I'll sit down for just a minute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll let you take a load off there. I really appreciate everybody uh, engaging in this conversation, and uh, it's a um, you know a lot of the things that we've been throwing around are being brought out, which is important if we're going to get to meeting your. Um, um, you know, your mission, you know, it's a mission of yours. And um, I, I think the dream was this, obviously the creator working through you. And uh, so here we are. Um, 
but um, I'm Leonard Forsman, Chairman of Squamish Tribe, at and President. And I think that this has already been brought up, but you know, when you talk to the Washington uh, delegation or um, representatives, um, they do talk about the obstacles and those political obstacles, obviously, PUDs, the port commissioners, um, and just in general, any, it's almost a, it's a principal issue, you know, like it can be, um, you know, First Amendment, Second Amendment, you know, uh, right to life, whatever. There's not, there seems this, it's like there's no either or, you know, you either, you either are uh, for keeping all the dams forever or you're for taking them all out. Well, I don't think that's necessarily true in this case, but you know what I'm running, what we run into is like, uh, I don't care if the dam is, um, you know, non producing, I don't want to set that precedent. I think Ron. And, and Elwha would say the same thing, same thing he ran up against against Elwha. It was like, there was more people just against the principle than the actual um, facility uh, and what the facility was worth. So uh, preserving the facility. So I know we can get over that, but I just know that that's what I hear is, okay, what do we do about the ports? What do we do about PUDs? What do we do about ag? And um, they're saying, we got to take care of that first. Now, that means more time, which I don't necessarily, when we hear the presentations tomorrow, we don't have a ton of time for as extinction schedules concerned. So that's, that's another thing that kind of pushes up against that. So um, I, when I was on the Orca task force appointed by governor Inslee, um, there was a lot of, you know, discussion about breaching removal. And there was also the associations, uh, especially like the ports, the Port Association would make statements on behalf of their associate, their membership that we oppose this. So there, the battle lines were kind of drawn there. So we need to get in and uh, that conversation about the um, practicality, I guess, and feasibility of doing this um, needs to be, that message needs to be brought. So if you had any more comments on that, I'd be appreciated. Thank you. Well, you're you're right. That is one of the things that it involves change and it's going to affect some some people. And if you own the barging system, that's a that's a problem. Uh, we've actually got a way that I think you can that we could make the bargers whole uh, in doing this. They probably have more transportation from uh, from uh, Columbia, the rest of the way down than they than they do currently. They could probably make up for that. Uh, but you know, we've known from the start that you got to take care of agriculture, you got to take care of uh, the power generation, uh, the ports, and other things. That's why we, that's why this bill costs so damn much. Uh, is trying to take care of those uh, those entities. But is thirty three and a half billion dollars too much? As I said, we spent seventeen billion dollars so far, and the one thing we haven't done is recover salmon. Uh, do we want to spend another seventeen over the next ten years and still not recover salmon, or do we want some results? And if you're looking at an infrastructure package that they say now is anywhere in the neighborhood, I don't know, two trillion, one trillion, whatever, is 33 and a billion, 33 billion dollars too much to ask for the Pacific Northwest to reconfigure how we're doing things? I don't think so. So uh, people put uh, uh, costs on it about, oh yeah, this is just an incredible amount, and we ought to do other things that don't cost as much. Well, okay, give me something. Tell me what the answer is. Uh, but you're right, it is, you have to address those things. And the, when I say uh, a year, year and a half, I say to get legislation done, not to take the dams out. That's gonna take a while because there's a lot of work that needs to, even if you pass this bill tomorrow, there's a lot of work that would need to be done prior to that. You'd need to dredge behind the, the, the dams to remove the silt and all that kind of stuff. I think you need to have the power in place before you remove the dams. You need to have the transportation system ready to go before you remove the dams. Uh, so that wouldn't be the first thing. All of a sudden we go in and take the dams out. There would be other, a lot of work that needed to be done prior to doing that. Well, I, I um, going back to Ron Allen, Jamestown again. Um, so um, yeah, good. Re is it on? What? Okay, I feel like I'm a car now. Uh, <laughs> a little too close to this mic. Okay. Um, 
that, that, that's something that Congressman, uh, no one has ever said they've accused me of not being in loud enough. So <laughs> where's Ernie? There he is. Uh, um, anyhow, going to, going to uh, the cost uh, and, and assessing the cost. So that's kind of what I was getting at with regard to we need uh, the resources to assess the, yeah. what, the, what is perceived to be the impact. Right. And uh, as an example, when we took the two dams out in uh, my backyard, um, they, were, they were freaked out about uh, their, their power cost was gonna rise. Well, we negotiated a deal with, with Bonneville and we got lower costs. So yeah. it was a win for these guys who, were, who, who thought they were gonna lose their valuable uh, local power. Right. So you can't know what um, what the solution is until you know what what they're what they're worried about. So on a power issue, on the ag issue, it's a different agenda. So what what how much water do you need, and then what what's the solution to make sure that you got the water when you need it? Yep. And, and saying the obvious to you, it's always during the summer months, right? That's the most thing. That's what the most they're worried about in the summer and early fall months, and that's what we're worried about because we got to have water to get the salmon up the river. So where do you find that balance? So, uh, so until we know what that is, um, then we, we can't sort out, you know, uh, that, okay, we've, we've, we've solved this problem. So that we dial down that, uh, that anxiety level on that, on that topic. And, uh, and so that's a lot of work to get, that, to get those things sorted out. Uh, you know, that, those, are only the, those are the two biggies, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, the ag guys and the ir irrigation right. needs, and the power guys with regard to their needs. And of course, there is transportation issues. Uh, yeah, there's true that. Yeah. Is, is that really a problem or not a, a problem in terms of, of what the solution is? So yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm really on board with how, how do we get this moving? And so if we got money in the infrastructure bill, your, your, your numbers and uh, a set or example is probably accurate at the end of the day, you know, because we're talking trillions. Yeah. So, so we just got to make sure, and, we're, and that's where we're going to need congressional leadership. That is, that it's instructed to be used in certain ways because there, you know, it, this uh, getting the stakeholders into the room together to resolve uh, to find to find the solution, as you as you know. But then there is the all the engineering work, all the design work, all the the the, the planning. Because right. uh, when we learn, you take the dams down. You can't just you can't just blow them up. Yep. You got to take them down little by little and let the silt come out and, and then you got to sort through that issue because that's a that's a huge environmental impact. And, and we got then you get the you get the EPA guys in the middle of the conversation <laughs> and, the, and the state ecology guys and what, what have you. So a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Yep. That make everybody happy. And last but not least, Army Corps. Oh, my God. Yep. Um, yep. So anyhow, to say the obvious, it's, it's a challenge, but, but you, you, we got to tee it up. Uh, and we need resources to tee it up. So yeah. um, if we can make this thing happen at the congressional level, then, uh, you know, Sean, uh, Sean knows uh, that this is a matter of, of, um, of how, it's, how it's pinned in the legislation um, so that uh, we, can, we can move this agenda forward. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's interesting you mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers when you talk about who would be the lead in some of this stuff and trying to put together a plan. I wouldn't put the Army Corps there. Uh, when they, when they came to brief me on the latest biological opinion, uh, them and some of their, some of the other agencies, the variable flex bill, whatever this one that's being challenged now in court, I said to them, so is this gonna speed up the time it takes for a small to get down the river to the ocean? Cause that's one of the big challenges. They said, no. I said, is it gonna help with salmon recovery? And they said, probably not. Then I said, how do you expect this, this buyout to survive a court challenge? They said, well, we see this as a bridge. I said, a bridge to what? A bridge to a final decision. I said, what's that final decision? They said, well, we don't know yet. I said, yes, you do. You're just not willing to say it. The Army Corps is never gonna support taking a dam out, never. 
I was told that by a BPA administrator when they started this biological opinion. In fact, it's interesting to note the Army Corps of Engineers said in their in their latest biop, uh, there's a paragraph in their in their work papers, I think it is, that said uh, the best chance of salmon recovery is to remove the lower Snake River dams. And then they said, but we have no, neither the resources or the authority to do that, so we're not going to recommend it. Hey, if I'm filing suit against that uh, biop, that's my line number one. Even they recognize it. But you know, it's kind of a lot of my colleagues that are, I'm mainly talking about McMorris Rogers and Newhouse. And they keep saying, you know, these dams are the fish ladder. So they're, they're, they're the fish passage in these dams is the most efficient in the world. They're 95% efficient, which means you only lose 5% of them at each dam. What they don't talk about is it's not necessarily the fish passage. It's the fact that all you've got is these still water pools. And as you all know, these smolts don't swim down the river, they get flushed. In fact, they're headed upstream when they're being flushed down the river. And we've lost the current when it goes into these slack water pools. And so now it takes something like 10 times as long for a smolt to get to the ocean as it used to. And that means they're more susceptible to predators and they're more susceptible to the warm water that is gonna occur. And I gotta tell you in all honesty, I think this is gonna be a really ugly year for salmon. When you look at the temperatures that are, that are uh, occurring out here and they're already releasing, they release water from Dworshak uh, to control the water temperature, to cool the water temperatures uh, through these dams. They're already releasing water from Dworshak, which is earlier than they, than they normally do by seven or eight weeks, something like that. So I think this is gonna be an ugly year for salmon. I really do. On that positive note. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We'll break it. I'll just break it. <laughs> I got a plug here. I can't tell if it's working. Where's the on button? Anyone? Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chad Coulter. I am a tribal member from Shoshone Bannock, uh, a fish biologist. I'm the director for the Shoshone Bannock tribes, their fish and wildlife department. Been playing this fish game for 25 years now. And I truly I understand what it takes to get fish back. I don't have a lot more to say than what's been said here from my colleagues, my friends. They said a lot of good words, and I'm not going to sit here and repeat them. What I would like to say is that I, you represent me, you represent my tribe, and I really have to say I appreciate it, and I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Your efforts are to get us to talk, to get us together. Um, I can't ask for much more than that from you. I uh, don't have anything bad to say. Don't have that. Just I appreciate it. I want to. Uh, I hope that moments like these, events like these, um, can show you that we support what you're doing, and we want you to continue to do it. Um, and if you need us in any way, let us know. We'll be there. If we have to speak, we have to hold you up. Whatever we got to do, we'll be there to get you through this, to get us through this. Thank you. Because it's time for change. It's now. Yep. We don't have tomorrow. We don't have another day. we got to get it done now. And I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I need about 50,000 more constituents just like you. <laughs> Congressman, you give an open mic to tribal people. You might get out of here today. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do appreciate you being here today. and. Uh, it's important, I'm not gonna be here tomorrow, but so you're the representative that I'm gonna to speak to. And so, and I'm gonna to speak to some things that have already been said, so I apologize, but you're talking very impassioned and I appreciate that. And I have to be honest, I, I Googled you and looked up at your Wikipedia page and a couple of things stood out. One is your hair was a lot darker in the picture that pulled up, but that happens, right? I'm working on it myself. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that you're a Republican, which makes sense because you're from a red state. Um, as I was listening to you, I'm thinking Idaho doesn't have any Democrats, maybe you do, but I, I don't know of that. 
because you sound like a Democrat when you're speaking. And then as we're talking here, I'm thinking, I'm sorry. But you're, you're talking about maybe not getting reelected. And it's unfortunate that this gets so, all these things get politicized these days, right? And I'm hearing people talk. It, this, and I think Chairman Allen spoke to it. This isn't a Democratic thing. This isn't a Republican no, it's thing. Not. It's a human issue. Yep. It's not even a tribal issue or non-tribal issue. It's a human issue. Yep. And when we're talking about these things, whether it's climate change, salmon, dams, what often happens is it gets politicized. People talk about the money, right? And you spoke to the billions and you asked, is, is 33 billion or whatever enough? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you also spoke about your children fishing someday. And when I think about the legacy that we as leaders are leaving for our future generations, they don't give a crap that we spent billions of dollars on removing these dams when they don't have salmon anymore, right? Yep. What cost is that to them? How much is our society going to be paying? How many billions of dollars are we going to be paying down the road if we don't start taking action now? And so when you're talking to your colleagues uh, there in D.C. or in the state and your friends uh, that are ours, um, just remind them this isn't about politics. It's about human. Yep. And you talk about the legacy that we're leaving. And I'm telling you, when our salmon are extinct a couple generations from now, and our children's children are talking about the legacy that we left, and we're talking about us, you're, you're a representative, you're gonna, you're gonna be in the history books, right? And they're gonna be talking about all these other individuals, these politicians, and we're at a, at a point in life where we can make a difference, and this is out there. And they're gonna be looking at who stood up and thought about our future generations and the life and sustainability for our future generations. And who got in the way of it and why? And they look at a, a price tag as a reason why they didn't or because of some politics that were going on. And that's the legacy. They're not gonna be proud of their ancestors. Yep. And that bothers me um, because when I think about, I spoke earlier today about the seven generations mindset, our ancestors are, are so important to us and upholding their legacy is so important for our children's children. Yep. And what I want is for my children's children to be proud of their ancestors, me, and the legacy that I left. And I think that you believe in that as well. I truly I do. do. And we need to instill it. It's not, it sounds simple, but it's important that we say these words to these Republicans and others that are against this, the opposition. Bring them to the table and find out what are the sticking points? Why can't we get this done? And then we talk about their legacy. And talk about what are they leaving? What kind of mark and what kind of selfishness are we having right now? And we're not thinking about our future. And so in closing, again, thank you so much for coming here and sitting through all this testimony and listening and paying attention. And then your very impassioned speech and very emotional. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you very absolutely. much. Idaho is kind of a red state, uh, but it's kind of funny. When I was... Uh, first elected, we had the most Republican legislature in the, in the nation. And we had a Democratic governor for 24 years that we could never beat. And uh, four of the seven statewide elected officials were Democrats. And two years before I came, our two congressmen were Democrats from Idaho, uh, Larry LaRocco and, uh, and uh, Richard Stallings. So it, it, Idaho switches back and forth. Uh, Right now, it's on the red state uh, uh, mode and, and will be. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> but you know, as partisan as you see Congress, and I'll be the first to admit it has gotten way too partisan. And I keep saying that pendulum swings back and forth. <laughs> told that to a guy in the airport one day and he says, yeah, the problem is it never stays centered long enough. And there's some truth to that. But this will come back around. I actually believe that a majority of the American people are more in the middle, left or right. But it's these way out here that get the attention. I tell people, you know, I could be on the news every night if I wanted to. All I got to do is go out and say something really stupid. And that gets you on the news. 
And believe me, there are enough Republicans and Democrats out there saying that stuff that I don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> so my constituents say, why aren't you saying what so-and-so is saying? And I say, because that's crazy. <laughs> but uh, it, it is, uh, I think this partisanship will come, will, will uh, start to move back toward, uh, toward collaboration. Because I think the American people are going to demand it. Uh, they don't like what's going on. We got like an 8% approval rating and I'm wondering where those eight people are. Because it is, it is a frustrating place to work right now. Uh, but you would be surprised if you saw our conversations between individuals. When I first, gave, when I first went to Congress 23 years ago now, I'd been in the state legislature for 14 years, been Speaker of the House for six years. So I kind of knew how politics worked. Politics is like anything else. It's about relationships that you build. And I said, uh, you know, I said to my staff, I want to meet the other members of Congress. So start calling around to offices and just set up 10, 15 minute appointments. Republican and Democrat, I don't care. I just want to go over and introduce myself. I'm Mike Simpson from Idaho. I used to be a dentist, da da da, and all this kind of stuff. Not really a political meeting or anything like that. Just kind of get to know them a little bit. Surprisingly, how hard that is to get done. And I, I didn't get around to every office, but between my work on committees and getting to know those members and stuff, I got to know almost all the members of Congress. That doesn't happen anymore. It used to be years ago that when you got elected to Congress, you moved to Washington. You took your family, took your kids. And because Congress only paid for trips home about three or four times a year. So you might come home for 4th of July and Christmas, and Thanksgiving, something like that. But you moved your family to Washington. That meant on weekends, you went to each other's barbecues. You went and saw each other's kids playing ball, Republican and Democrat. You got to know each other. That didn't happen anymore. Nobody moves their, their, their families to Washington, in the House anyway. And in fact, almost all of them go home every single weekend because they believe their constituents require that. That means you don't get to know other members. You know, you and I can disagree on something and be vehement in our opposition, but it's hard for me to call you names if I know your kids and your wife. That's where some of the, the incivility has, has come in uh, to Congress. And somehow that's got to change. This system only works when you respect one another when you can talk to each other, when you can disagree vehemently about an issue and still be friends. And you'd be surprised how many members of Congress, especially those that have been there for a while, understand this. And you'd be surprised at our conversations behind the scene. But what you see on TV is those 25 or 30 Democrats or 25 or 30 Republicans that are just kind of out there on the edge. And that's too bad. But the rest of us don't really want to be on TV that much. So it's kind of the way it is. But like I say, it'll change. I have full faith in this system of government. And I think it will change. I think we have time for just one more. So Mr. Stensgar, if you'd like to go ahead and, and finish up this portion of the summit for us. Thank you. I think it, is this on? You can hear me? You want me to get closer? <laughs> All right. This isn't the first time I've been in front of you, Congressman. Yeah. Most time it's been with my hand up. <laughs> sometimes you gave, sometimes you didn't. But um, thank you. I think uh, we've, been, we've been on the stage for, for a long time. I think when uh, Ron Allen had hair, but uh, we've been out. We've been out here. But Hell, that was a long time. That was a long time ago. I just appreciate 
you, you being here and, and coming from Idaho, I know you know breach talking about breaching a dam is is going to be uphill battle, but it isn't the first time that that Indian country has been in an uphill battle. All our lives have been in this in this fight. I look at the the battles and of um, past leaders and past wars that we that we've been in with the help of some some congressional people, but. The initiative was was from Indian country itself. We had great leaders, tremendous leaders. Some of them um, spoke today. Um, some remember uh, those leaders that spoke in the past and then learned from them. And um, you know, Billy Frank, we're we're in this country. Cal Peters, I heard uh, somebody relate to to Mr. Peters. I think the chairman walking in Cal's footsteps. They're, they're here today. Look at the boat decision. Um, all those things have, have happened because Indian country started that. So I was sitting here thinking about, you know, how we were going to win this fight. And I heard you say, you know, it's up to you, it's up to you. And yeah, it's up to us, it's up to us and, and the rest of America, but we need to begin this fight. And I, we have an organization, you know, affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians. And I think we ought to begin, begin this initiative right away. Leonard sitting up here as our as our president. I think we have chairman in our audience that can that can start this. Uh, let's start putting this together and and, and continuing that, that that dialogue. We need to um, meet the private groups. We need to meet the ag people. People. We have a spokesman that can talk to them, present our view in a good way, in a diplomatic voice, in a way that makes sense for all of us, for all of America. You know, I had a I had occasion last summer to go up to go up to Snake, and and on a jet boat, and it was so beautiful. Um, seeing uh, the mountain goats come down to the to the water to drink, um, we were fishing for uh, sturgeon. We didn't catch any. Caught some bass, but I was wondering about uh, looking at the water, wondering about the salmon coming up there, as and we talked about it. I was with. Uh, Chief Allen, chairman for the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And um, it was a, just a beautiful run. Idaho is a beautiful state as the Northwest. And I say that all the time. When I crossed Indian country, I'd always talk about, about the Northwest, the mountains, the beautiful rivers, uh, access to the ocean. Uh, everything that, that was said today, I think somebody brought up huckleberries in, in our mountains, how important that is to, to us as Indian people. But now when we go out picking with my family, I see a lot of non-Indians out there picking. Um, same way with salmon fishing, sportsmen, all that, you know, it, it, it's important to us. I think with the leadership that we have in Indian country, we begin this nucleus, Leonard, and we take this to NCAI, we make it a national issue, uh, but, but we start right here. Along with you, and maybe you can direct us in some, some cases, maybe we can direct you. I just, on behalf of my tribe and probably the rest of Indian country sitting in here today, we want to thank you for, for presenting today and, and talking to us in a good way. I, um, you always had my support and you'll continue to have my support and I uh, wish you well, God bless you. Well, thank you so much for everybody's participation. This is exactly what we wanted to do when we started planning this. This was the whole goal and point of coming together and being able to have this open dialogue and communicate with one another and share our, our pieces, uh, our stories of our tribes and our cultures and our upbringing. Um, and this is, so, this is so critical. This is what people need to hear. You know, and that's exactly what Simpson has been talking about. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when, when I, had heard something big was coming and then come February and here we go, we hit the ground running and um, Vice Chair Wheeler, he's really hit the pavement going from tribe to tribe and really trying to make his way around and then meeting Simpson and talking to folks. And I said, you know, if this, if this doesn't go through right now, these two are gonna go to their graves making it happen. Very positive of that. So we're gonna move forward. Um, that said, we're just going to go ahead and wrap up, but a couple of things I just wanted to mention to you all tonight. Uh, first of all, we have Linda Mapes here, who is a reporter with the Seattle Times, and she recently published a book 
and it's called Orca Shared Waters Shared Home. It's a wonderful piece. Uh, we invited her here to share it. It is out front in the lobby. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, if you'd like to purchase a copy, I think that's an option as well. Secondly, we are having a social hour tonight. We will have hors d'oeuvres and beverages. Uh, your first two are on Vice Chairman Wheeler, so take advantage of that. I'm not joking. Come get your two drinks. <laughs> Um, so please join us. If you go to the hotel lobby, uh, there's a conference room. There should be signage up. Um, so I hope to see you there. And with that, I would like to ask uh, Nez Perce Tribe Chairman Samuel Penny to come forward and provide us with some closing comments. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, taking the time out of your busy, busy schedules to join us here today. Congressman Simpson, Senator Murray, and Senator Crapo staff, as well as others that are joining by Zoom. And also I'd like to thank Squawks and Island Tribe Chairman Peters and for their hospitality. And also I'd like to thank our drummers that were here this morning. You know, that's always a great way to open up any of our meetings that we have as, as tribes. But I wanted to just share with you just quickly a couple of comments that I made recently. So I served on the Nesper Tribal Executive Committee for I'm just in my 10th three-year term. But I just wanted to share this one statement for you because it's something that Congressman Simpson mentioned as well. So I first served on the Nesper Tribal Executive Committee in 1989. So I witnessed over 30 years of nearly continuous litigation over the United States failing to live up to its statutory obligations under laws like the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act and not upholding their treaty responsibilities. Now I often thought when we were talking earlier about the congressional representatives, both in the Senate and the House, like, you know, the dams are in my district. You know, it's not, why are you talking about this? It's not just, so I think for tribes, and I speak on behalf of the Nespers tribe, and I share a story with Congressman Simpson. I don't know if you remember this, but I went to visit. He's, we only have two districts in Idaho, first district and second district. And I invited him up to Nespers tribe and his response is, well, that's not my district, and I probably shouldn't go up there. So my response was, and I think this applies to, to all of those in the Senate and the House, no matter, no matter where you're from, no matter if you have uh, Native Americans in your district or reservations, you still have a trust responsibility to Indian tribes no matter if you don't have them Native Americans in your district. So the point is, is that you know, when they vote, they vote on things that affect all of us directly. So my message to the United States Congress is that, you know, you need to uphold your trust responsibility to Indian tribes and save the salmon in the Northwest and the Orca. But I wanted to share with you, I've been writing down notes <clears throat> all uh, this morning, but I just want to share with some of you, some of the things that were stated today from different tribal leaders, and I think they all have a, a similar tone, and I'll just read some of them. One said, talked about uh, sustenance, you know, the fur, food nourishment of the salmon for, for the tribes. Uh, one spoke, we have to speak for the animals. Another said, said, we need bold actions now. Another speaker said, relegated to getting fish from the back of a, a truck. I shared a story just recently. We had a former councilwoman on our 
council, and this has been several years ago, she'd come up to me and she told me, she says, you know, it makes my heart sick when I see a, a tribal member uh, standing out in a parking lot with a garbage bag waiting to get one fish, is what she said. And then another speaker talked about water is, is the lifeblood of our existence. We had another speaker say, salmon are who we are and we need to find balance for a way of life. Another speaker said, we, we need to restore salmon to the upper Columbia basin. We had a speaker talk about, we're here to fight for what I believe in. We all need to stick together. And uh, Vice Chairman Wheeler talked about, you know, speak the truth and uh, you need to take action now. And then Congressman Simpson said something that, several things very interesting to me. He said, you know, time for taking action is now. He said, we're gonna to have to ch cho cho uh, change the way, what we were doing. And then he talked a little bit about collaboratives and the time for talking is over. So what that reminded me of, clear back in 1879, after the Nespers War of 1877, Chief Joseph finally had a chance to go back to Washington, D.C. on January, January 14th, 1879. He spoke at Lincoln Hall to a number of dignitaries, but hearing all the tribes speak and sharing their stories, it made me think of you know, some of the things that Chief Joseph was talking about. He went back to talk about all the injustices that happened to, uh, in, in this case, the Nespers tribe, but I think it applies to uh, many tribes across this country. But I just want to share that few uh, excerpts from that speech. And here's what he said, Chief Joseph in 1879. <clears throat> At last, I was granted permission to come to Washington and bring my friend Yellow Bull and our interpreter with me. I'm glad I came. I've shaken hands with a good many friends, but there are some things I want to know, no one can seem to explain. Since I cannot understand how the government sends a man out to fight us as it did, as it did General Miles and then breaks his word. Such a government has something wrong about it. Then he went on to say, he says, they all say they are my friends and that I shall have justice, but while all their mouths talk right, I do not understand why nothing is done for my people. I have heard talk and talk, but nothing is done. And I think I heard that same from, from several speakers today that we, we, we talked a little bit about collaboration, time for collaboration is over. And I think when I thought about this, I think it's, that's kind of what jo Chief Joseph was talking about. You know, we've heard talk and talk, but nothing is done. And then he went on to say, Good words do not last long until they mount to something. And a chair, a Vice Chairman Wheeler mentioned something about that in his, uh, his presentation. And when I thought about that, just that one sentence, to, to me, what it means, including myself, is that you know, we can all say good things and intend good things, but unless they actually happen, they're meaningless. And I think that's what Chief Joseph was talking about. So. We've heard a lot of great di dialogue. Uh, as Congressman said, time for collaboration is over. It's time for action is what I believe Chief Joseph meant many, many years ago. <clears throat> and then he concluded uh, part of this speech. He said, I'm tired of talk that comes to nothing. It makes my heart sick when I remember all the good words and all the broken promises. So I think you know, just reading those words and applying it even to this day, I think it sums up what we're trying to do here today and tomorrow, that it is time for action. And, you know, we look forward to the tomorrow and the future to make sure this happens because as someone said, we don't want extinction to happen on our watch. And as tribes, you know, we've always come together 
when we when there was an issue that we all have a common interest in that we do come together and we stick together and this is one of those issues that we need to make sure that we fulfill for future generations i was asked a question earlier about you know is this the only tri time tribes really come together on issues like this and i, I said well no not not necessarily you know we have health issues that we talk about you know we had indian child welfare issues that we talk about there's just a number of issues that tribes across this nation have a common interest in and we've always been resilient and be able to come together and make sure that those things are addressed but i want to again thank all of you for taking time to be here uh, thank you congressman simpson the senate staff here and those joining by zoom we Really appreciate you taking the time to start this dialogue. And as the congressman said, you know, if we don't get the funding uh, in the infrastructure bill, it's not over. We will we'll still continue to make sure that we fight for the survival of the, of the salmon and the orca in the Northwest. Katsuyaya, thank you. Okay, and just one quick announcement. Um, Marie handed out release forms to the front tables. If you could please get those signed and you can just turn them in at the registration table when you leave. Those are just so the camera crews have their bases covered. And Chairman, our Vice Chairman Wheeler is gonna close us out with a prayer. Uh, thank you, Kehlani. Uh, yeah, please stand up and stretch out a little bit. We'd just like to say a closing prayer for the day. Uh, send us off on our evening and uh, um, thank everybody for participating today. So, thank you, Creator. Uh, thank you, Creator, for this beautiful day. Thank you, Creator, for this sacred land, this, uh, this, this beautiful land, Squaxin Island. And thank everybody. Oikolo Himyuma all of our friends and family for being here today and sharing their stories and those that are, are bearing witness to the testimony today to carry that message on. We thank you, Creator, for giving us our eyes and our ears and our knowledge and our senses that we do have to act, to act and to act boldly and to do the things that need to be done. And we thank you, Creator, for guiding each, of, each and every one of our footprints to this land today so that we could meet here, here in this sacred place to hear the words and, and to uh, continue to advocate for those that cannot speak for themselves, to honor our relationships, all of our relationships with the salmon. And also creator for blessing us on this day and blessing all of our families and all of our relations. Let's see out, yeah. Hey. All right, have a good evening. Only two. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all tonight, and we'll be back here at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Just saying.